coming to all of you today uh, with uh, some great content for the next three hours. We are recording uh, today's call uh, and then we'll be posting the content back onto our YouTube channel. And in case you miss any of it or all of it, you'd like to go back and watch some of it later, that's great. Uh, so the really the first 15 minutes is uh, an opening conversation about virtual communication tools for your teams. Again, as I said a little bit earlier, uh, before we went live, uh, these are some tools that teams are already using. Uh, even when they can meet in person, they're still using some of these tools uh, for ongoing conversations outside of team meetings. But these are also really good tools for the times that we're living in right now where uh, you'd still like to meet. Uh, you'd still like to be having some ongoing conversations. Uh, it's a, just a nice way to stay connected. So really today, what I want to do is cover three tools. Uh, Zoom, which is uh, actually what we're using today to broadcast this out uh, through our Twitch channel. Uh, Zoom is a video conferencing or even phone conferencing tool. Uh, Slack, which is a, a, a communications tool, uh, pretty much mostly text-based. Uh, and it's also based on what are called channels. Dig into that in a second. And Discord is the third tool we'll cover today. Uh, another team communication, uh, text-based. There's also some audio video call options. And I'm going to go into a little bit of the what, what you get for free, uh, what do you get if you pay a little bit for it. Uh, the other thing I definitely would like to mention, and I'll put some links on our uh, virtual resource, uh, remote resource page on our website, I'll put some links out there. Uh, there is a, an organization called TechSoup that if your team is um, linked to a nonprofit of some kind, either a, a parent booster club or your community-based team housed out of a nonprofit, you could qualify for a TechSoup account, which would give you discounts on software, hardware, but also licenses for some of the pro versions of, of these platforms. So a quick kind of look at Zoom. Uh, again, the tool that we're using today for this call, uh, the one we'll be using moving forward for these uh, calls, and then uh, streaming this out through Twitch, uh, Zoom does have a free version. So it's, it's mostly a, a conference call system, video conferencing, or again, you can just call in on, on a phone. Uh, with the free account, you can do up to 40 minute calls with up to 100 people. So if you wanted to stick to the free account as a robotics team, you want to do Zoom, you want to have some face-to-face -face meetings, you just would have to know that you'd be limited to 40 minutes. Uh, you can do some screen sharing though, uh, with those calls, uh, you can do what are called breakout rooms. So that all the people who've joined into the call, you can actually break them out into separate conversations. So if you want to do a little brainstorming session or put all your uh, sub teams kind of out into their own breakout rooms to go have their own conversations. Uh, and you can also do some whiteboarding. Zoom is uh, one of the tools that a lot of our schools are using right now for e-learning. Uh, uh, so schools are getting it for free. So if you're a school-based team, uh, you could actually maybe reach out to your school administration, see if they've gotten uh, licensing with Zoom. You might actually be able to get to uh, one of the pro level accounts for your robotics team. So with the paid account, that is the, kind of the next level with Zoom, you do have the opportunity now to have longer calls, but you're still limited to 100 people. Uh, then uh, you can also, uh, with Zoom, uh, there is the ability to add kind of cafeteria style um, additional paid features, whether it's additional hosts and hosts, additional hosts allow you to have um, calls at the same time with different groups. So each host would be able to have their own calls. Uh, you could also increase the number of attendees from 100 to 500, uh, et cetera. So there is, once you get into the basic level account, there is sort of a cafeteria style option where you can add. Uh, they, they typically do monthly subscriptions, and then you can either pay monthly or pay annually. Uh, so there's some options there. Uh, Zoom integrates with Slack, uh, with Google Calendar and more, so you can schedule calls and, and put them out onto your Google Calendar. Uh, there's also a lot of controls with Zoom. So if you're doing a team meeting uh, and you bring everybody in, there are a lot of controls that the host has over uh, muting everybody when they come in. Uh, there's a chat feature within Zoom. You can also 
uh, lock that down. Uh, with Zoom, you can uh, control who gets to chat with whom during the conversation, if, if everybody can chat independently or just to the host. So those are some good tools. Zoom is definitely something I, uh, I've found to be uh, a good tool for us. Uh, First Indiana Robotics, we've actually been using Zoom for quite a while now. Uh, as we have meetings with schools and teams uh, all over the state, it's been a, a good tool for us to have uh, our, our rookie team calls where we reach out and uh, representatives from the different rookie teams will get in and we'll do uh, content calls with them and uh, do some different trainings. Uh, and then we can also uh, do larger group trainings as well. Uh, Slack. So now Slack is uh, a text-based tool, and it is a chance for people to communicate. Um, and you use channels. Uh, each channel then could be a subgroup of your team. So you could have mechanical operations, however you break your team up, business side. Uh, you could have your um, design team, whatever. You could have those channels set up. And then people join those channels and have ongoing conversations with them in them. Uh, this you can also within Slack then have direct conversations with individuals on the team. Uh, and then as a mentor, you can put uh, you can blast out uh, um, messages to the whole team at once again or to just a sub team uh, is a really strong tool for uh, communication. Uh, really is kind of a replacement for email in a lot of cases. So if you think about what could we use as an internal communications tool for our team uh, that could replace email? This is a strong uh, tool for that. Uh, with the free Slack, you get one workspace. Um, you can uh, do one-to-one -one voice and video call within Slack on the free account. Uh, you can upgrade to a standard. Uh, again, I had mentioned earlier about TechSoup. Take a look at uh, if your organization is tied to a nonprofit, if you qualify, uh, you can get the standard uh, actually through TechSoup for free. Uh, this is uh, uh, allows you uh, a lot more uh, tools and options within Slack. But then one of the nicer features is that it, it does upgrade you to the ability to have up to 15 people uh, on a voice or video call at once. Again, a, a real good text-based tool. Uh, and there's also some other um, integrations you can build into Slack. You can build in a Google Calendar, uh, your Google Docs. You can build in, if you're using Salesforce or if you're using some other features of, of other platforms, you can actually integrate quite a few things into Slack. Uh, and then it allows you to share those features within the, within the communication piece. Uh, and then there's some other fun pieces too. You can add GIF type conversations and polls. So if you want to poll the team, uh, you've got a, a poll set up and you want to do, uh, we're ordering pizza for the meeting on Saturday afternoon. What what toppings does everyone want? And then they could vote, uh, et cetera. There's, the polling feature is a, a really nice thing to be able to quick uh, throw out something for the team. Uh, and then finally, Discord. Uh, and I'll show you here in a second on my screen, I'll show you uh, what Discord looks like. Similar to Slack, uh, it's, however, it's completely free. Uh, you can create channels based on topic, sub team, et cetera. Uh, so again, programming channel, operations channel, you could even have a, a chit chat channel where team members could go and have, you know, fun side conversations. Um, it's, a, it's a nice way for, you know, people who want to have a silly conversation about something that's going on. Uh, you can stream your screen. So this is a way then you could, as a mentor, you could do some training uh, with your students remotely. And uh, we do have a document on our website right now that uh, thanks to FRC Team 3176, uh, we have um, a document that they shared with us uh, that covers a how to use Discord and how they've been using uh, Discord as well. Uh, and I want to thank them for uh, posting that, uh, sharing that with us. I'm going to get that link out to everybody so you can see it.
And again, we're coming to you live today uh, on Twitch via our Zoom account. Uh, here you can see this is what Discord looks like. The um, uh, This is just a test channel, but you can see there's all sorts of channels on the left-hand side uh, on our Discord uh, channel. Uh, and uh, a goofy Jim Carrey GIF there, just kind of show you that you can do GIFs, uh, but there's other communication tools, there's ways to go live. And then by going into each of these channels, then you can see that uh, memes, FTC, FRC, this is a way for then uh, within the first Indiana Discord for us to specify the types of conversations uh, that are going on. That way if people have got uh, things they want to talk about within the FTC world, they can go to the FTC channel. Uh, if they've got some fun robot picks, they can go in there and, and place their uh, robot pictures. So we are, uh, uh, this is a, it's a nice way to, to communicate. I'm going to share now with you the remote resources page. This is uh, where we're uh, currently storing. This is where we're currently storing um, a uh, set of links to uh, different resources that teams are sharing with us. We're asking for all of you, if you've got resources you'd like to share with us, please send them to us. Uh, info at indianafirst.org is the email to share those with. Here you can see, here's the FRC uh, Team 3176 Discord white paper. Uh, you can download that. It's a PDF. Uh, I thank you to Nathan uh, Heidegger for sharing that with us. And they did a real nice uh, piece here, uh, screenshots and everything on how to set up a Discord, uh, how they utilize Discord. A very, very easy way for you to uh, read one document, get it set up, uh, and you can be up and running with your own team Discord today. So uh, that's the three communication tools, again, Zoom, Slack, uh, and Discord. Uh, Zoom, uh, our uh, video calling and video conferencing, and then uh, Slack and Discord, both text-based uh, features uh, that have a variety of options uh, for you to interact with. Um, I've got about uh, two minutes left of my time. However, I'm going to uh, bring in uh, our next group. Uh, I believe uh, at 4.15, we've got Renee. Hi, Chris. Renee, welcome. I'm gonna bring you onto the screen here. Sounds great. Welcome on board and uh, 4.15, we're gonna move on to the conversation with the student board of directors, I take it? Yep, that's the plan. Very good, all right, well, um, and uh, we have a guest later, Evan Hochstein. Um, and Evan is uh, connected but muted and uh, camera off until he joins us. So we're excited for all the content today. We are recording, we are live. So uh, without further ado, Renee, I will mute myself and let you guys go. But before you mute yourself, can you verify that this looks good on the stream so that I know I'm sharing the right screen? It should have find your strengths, build your team, make your program th thrive. Oh, I, I better uh, open up the Twitch window here. <laughs> and uh, as a matter of fact, because uh, since I'll be watching for questions during the Twitch. Ooh, and somebody's got a, a, a keyboard typing away there. Hopefully I won't get some kind of weird feedback, but yeah, we can see, Renee, we can see uh, the screen. Perfect. That's fantastic. All right, so Chris, I'll stay tuned. Um, and if there are any questions, so feel free just to, you know, let us know as those come in um, and then we can just go from there. So hi everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Renee Becker-Blau. I'm the president of First Indiana Robotics. And uh, we're looking forward to talking a little bit about uh, strengths, building a team, 
making a program thrive. Um, but a lot of this is really focused on, you know, learning a little bit more about your individual self and what you do. So I have our student board of directors members here on the call with me. Um, I'd say everyone, let's get ready to unmute in a little bit. Um, Cause first what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what it means to be a team and why trust is important. And then also ask you a couple of questions about uh, what you currently believe in. So first, I, you know, I feel like I kind of harp on this, you know, for a little bit, uh, but I do have a favorite speaker. His name is Simon Sinek. And so recently I was reading a book called Together is Better, a little book of inspiration. It's a kid's book that he wrote recently. And it says, um, a team is not a group of people that work together. A team is a group of people that trust each other. So I thought that was really important and useful in terms of this discussion we we're having today. So I wanted to kind of pull out what trust was and have a conversation with our student board of directors around um, what trust means to them. So students, what do you think about this question? What does trust mean to you and in the context of trusting each other as a team? Um, I can answer this one. So um, a lot of when you referenced the quote by Simon Sinek, um, trust has a lot to do with, I guess, how much um, your team members are willing to kind of take risks with other people in your group. Because I guess without any risk, you can't really move forward. But um, if you're willing to take risks and let someone else do something that um, you're not able to do, then that's kind of where trust comes in, like knowing that other people can accomplish tasks that you can't, because you can't do everything. So that's kind of how I think it plays a lot into FRC, especially. Absolutely. And can you, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us what team you're with? Yeah, um, I'm Priya. I uh, spent the last three years and last year was president of 868. And this year I helped found 8232, a rookie team in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, this is my second year on the board and I help Renee a lot with uh, like state advocacy and different initiatives with student experience here in First Indiana Robotics. Perfect. And then for our other student board of directors members, let's try to do the introduction at the beginning. Priya should have started with that. So thank you for jumping right in. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So I see a couple of people have their video going. Uh, is any, would anyone like to jump in next to talk a little bit about what they feel trust is all about? Sure. Um, so I'm Devin. I have been involved with her since I was nine. I did six years of FLL two years of FRC on my local team, and now I'm also on 8232 with Priya. Um, but I think um, as far as trust goes, the people I tend to trust the most are usually the people I've worked with in an intense situation where there's maybe like high stakes involved, like we're at a competition and we're on a time crunch and that kind of situation, something like that. Um, I'm super close with my brother and sister, and I think a big part of that is because we've been on first teams together, working together, having to trust each other. Um, it really, it just, it makes you rely on each other and discover each other's strengths because you need, you need each other in order to get everything done. But I think another factor of working in that kind of situation is that it also makes you want to bring your best self to the table because you want to get the work accomplished too. And so I think that really helps other trust in you as well, which I think is really important because in order to have a healthy trusting relationship between members, it really, it just has to be a two way street. Awesome. So I think that I think that that's a great point. And I, is it kind of like, it sounds like the longer you know someone and the more opportunities you've had to interact with them, uh, the more likely you are to trust them if they've been reliable and you've consistently had those good experiences? Yeah, exactly. All right. So Sam, did you have something to add in? Yeah, so I think being on a team and on a leadership team, I think the big part about trust is knowing that everybody's there for a reason. Everybody's there and they have their own skill set and their own things that they're really good at. And they're in they're where they are and they're doing what they're doing because they love what they're doing. 
Um, and I think that the most important thing going into a group is having a, a trust and knowing that you, like Priya said, that you can't do everything, um, that it's really important to go out and make sure that you're finding other people's strengths and making sure that you can rely on people to do the job that you know they can do. And that's a big part of working on a team and even going out to younger members, just trusting that they have the ability to learn and that they have the, just growing that ability and making sure that they can have that independent spirit and being to trust them with that going forward. That's, that's really important too. Excellent. So we have, we have a few more student board directors members here as well. I, if anyone would like to talk a little bit more about trust, we can certainly do that. The next slide will basically show a breakdown of some of the questions because since we're talking about trust, we want our audience to also trust us. And so I figured we could share some of the things like what problems do you want to solve in the world? What brings us joy, you know, et cetera, so people can get to know us a little bit better before we dive right into some of these team building activities. Lucy. Yeah, so sure. I'm Lucy and I'm from um, Team 3940 Cybertooth. I am the team president and I've been involved in FIRST for a long time, started kind of volunteering and then into FLL and then now into F FRC. Um, and I think a big part of trust is also just kind of seeing effort from people um, when they bring their best and they show that, that's kind of when you can move together with them and uh, rely on them because you know that they are gonna bring their A game and they really care about things, kind of what we were talking about earlier. So yeah. Perfect. And then we let's continue with a few introductions. Um, so Bella, do you want to introduce yourself and the team you're with? Yeah, hi, hi my name is Bella. I'm with Team 5010 and I'm a programmer. For us a lot, we talk about like communicating with other parts of our team. So it's a lot of like, trusting people to do their jobs and kind of show up and do their part which is good um and it kind of creates a more tight-knit community among our team and it honestly gives it a lot more of a homey feel awesome so and then karen um hi i'm karen i'm co-captain of team 7617 um one thing i think is really important about trust is like you have to understand that everyone has a stake in what you're doing and everyone really cares so even if you disagree, everyone's still working towards the same goal and trying to understand that um, because everyone has a stake, everyone's going to do their best and that it's okay to tell people your limits, to find out other people's limits and to find ways to delegate tasks so that everyone is working on what they love and what they want to do. Awesome. And then Lucy, again, we have two Lucys, Lucy B and Lucy G. Hi, I'm the other Lucy. Um, I'm from Team 461 Westside Boiler Invasion from West Lafayette, Indiana. I'm our media's sub-team head. And for me, building trust is a lot of like taking and giving. You have to form like connections with like kind of as many people as you can because you need to realize that working as a team really means as a team. And stereotypically, there is no I in team. And to make this trust with people, you have to accept that you might have differences with people, but ultimately you have to get over them and just work through your problems. Awesome. So I think everyone's been introduced. Uh, and if you have not, let me know and we'll jump you back in. Uh, and so going to our next slide, you know, one of the things I really wanted to focus on uh, and one of the my favorite questions ever to ask is what problem do you want to solve in the world? But sometimes that can be a little bit of a scary question when I talk with students about that. Um, but it leads to a lot of really good discussions beyond just uh, what do you um, like normally you would maybe ask questions like where do you want to go to school or what do you want to study but when you ask what problems do you want to solve in the world there's a really rich back and forth that can happen um, and so as a you know someone who enjoys mentoring students I really like kind of going into this question and encouraging other mentors uh, to do that as well and so as we start talking about you know building our the team talking about uh, some of the different personality types and what team building activities you can do I thought it was good to kind of share these questions because it's it's some of my favorite options. So uh, in terms of what problems do you want to solve in the world, um, I would love to have one of our student board directors share their questions. So uh, 
I'll share what mine is in terms of the problem I'm, I like solving, which I, I think explains why I'm here today uh, doing what I'm doing. But then um, I'm going to jump to Devin next, and then we'll kind of rotate around um, the circle from there. So the problem that I want to solve in the world uh, is essentially that I, I believe that regardless of race, gender, or socioeconomic status, every student should have the ability to choose if they'd like to go into uh, a STEM field or not, regardless instead of life circumstances choosing for them. So I want to solve the problem of access to, you know, these STEM opportunities for students uh, to make sure that it's, you know, fair and equitable. And that is why I'm president of First Indian Robotics. And that's why I'm really passionate about making sure that students have this great access. So Devin, what is your problem that you'd like to solve in the world? So I, it feels like an understatement, but I really love FIRST. And I just, I see so much value in this program because it's really a workforce development program. And it's genuinely changed my life. That's not an exaggeration at all. And I'm just very grateful for it. And it just, it really breaks my heart that there's still so many kids and schools who don't have access to this program. And so I want to work to get fun more funding in schools for workforce development programs. Last year, I attended the first National Advocacy Conference in Washington, D.C., where I learned that lobbying is a really effective way of um, influencing the bills that are being passed and that the ones that allocate funds to schools for programs like FIRST. And so I want to do STEM advocacy work to help put programs like FIRST in front of kids who want it and kids who need it because I definitely needed this program growing up and I'm grateful that I had it and so I want to bring it to others also. Fantastic. And so I think, Sam, you had talked a little bit earlier, but maybe you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself. So why don't you introduce yourselves and then why don't you answer the question, what brings you joy? Um, so I'm Sam. I'm um, Team 3176 is project manager. So that just means that um, I'm the leader of the student leadership. And so I make sure and oversee that all our schedules and tasks are being completed on time. Um, so going off of that, a lot of what brings me joy is being able to work with a team of very, very strong individuals and being able to bring um, people's strengths together to be able to solve um, tasks and bigger goals. And even more than that, being able to educate is something that brings me a lot of joy, being able to look at newer students, underclassmen, and being able to grow their skills and find out what interests them, whether that's electrical or fabrication or leadership. It's just something that I love seeing grow throughout their years on the team. Fantastic. All right. So Lucy, uh, we're going to have Lucy G to clarify. Uh, you're going to go next. So for what problem I want to solve in the world is that I want to work on equality specifically with healthcare because I've seen it from both sides from having patients just be sent away because they're not the typical cishet white male. It's such a small bubble that medical research has been done on and it's caused issues with people going undiagnosed and caused a whole lot of issues and it's something that I want to work to. But I've also seen it from the healthcare provider point of view where typically you have the doctors who are earning so much money, so many of them are men. And then you have all these nurses who a lot of people ignore, but are actually the background of this. A lot of them are female and their male counterparts are often ignored. So I wanna work on advocating for equality in both of those and making sure that everyone has equal access and equal rights in a field that oftentimes you see one side of medicine as male dominated and another side is strictly female dominated. Excellent, I think uh, Lucy B, you kind of, you have a complimentary problem exactly. you'd like yeah. to solve in the world. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm kind of along the side with Lucy G where there's, um, the kind of like a field that's exploding because so much is needed in um, the medical world and so much is needed to be invested, especially with up and coming technology and that 
side of it as opposed to like the more um, medical and like biological side of it. So I want to combine my love of STEM and um, love of engineering that I've fostered within first and then combine that with my love of helping people and caring for people and treating them. And um, I'm going to go into biomedical engineering so I can kind of do research and help develop tools that can help cure and treat people. So yeah. Awesome. And then Priya, what brings you joy? Um, I'd say um, it's kind of just helping people become them their best selves. I did a lot of work with outreach and STEM education and giving people the opportunity, like no matter who, like I worked with a lot of toddlers and small kids and middle schoolers, but also like um, seniors at um, senior living centers and just giving people the opportunity to learn something and, and help people become their best selves is really important to me. Um, I find that really empowering to myself. And even just like, even on my robotics team, it's always been a joy to see people grow under my leadership and really be able to guide and mentor people so that they can find their own um, problems that they want to solve. Excellent. And Karen, can you talk a little bit about the problem that you'd like to solve in the world? Oh, I think I did that backwards. Bella and then Karen. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the problems that a lot of, um, especially just my township fishers that faces is that we don't have a lot of like lower um, kind of people talking, talking about STEM and getting introduced to STEM. So it'd be really cool to introduce something other than like Hour of Code, but more on the mechanical side to our younger kids, because a lot of them don't understand like what robotics is until high school, because we don't have a lot of either VEX or FTC teams around. So it'd be really cool to kind of see everyone start kind of um, at a younger age and like get introduced to that and kind of develop their love for it over the years. Fantastic, because you're definitely at an advantage being involved with the FIRST program in high school compared to other people who might not be. Um, I mean, the things that you're learning in FIRST as an FRC team are things that, you know, you wouldn't learn till junior year of college currently. So I think that that application applies, of course, to those elementary school students too. All right, Karen? Um, the problem I want to solve in the world is educational inequality. Um, as a child of immigrants, I always knew that education would be the key to a lot of things in life. You know, my parents wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that they were highly educated. But then I started to understand that there are a lot of opportunities that people just don't have access to. And there's a lot of places and a lot of uh, communities that don't have the same opportunity as other communities. And so my, my goal is to try to find like technological, especially software solutions to some of these issues. Um, to make an education more equitable and more equal across the world. Fantastic. All right, so we're going to dive down into um, a little bit more about personality types. And so when we were looking at the session, you know, kind of our big thing was, you know, finding your strengths. And so when you talk about trusting people, uh, being able to get to know them, understanding how to work with them, you know, these pieces are all critical to that. And so uh, I wanted to just give an overview of how the original uh, Myers-Briggs uh, system was created because I started diving into the history uh, and got super distracted today about it. But it was really interesting because Catherine Briggs, uh, when she met her daughter's future husband, um, she realized that he looked at the world really differently compared to her and her daughter. And so they started just researching different personality types because that was something that was really interesting to them. And then Carl Jung, he had published this um, psychological types, the psychology of uh, individual age Station. Maybe there's a, yep. Uh, and so they saw that around 1923 and they wanted that to be more accessible to people on a broader scale. And so um, when I was reading this, I kind of nerded out because I have a degree in scientific and technical communication. And I viewed this as, you know, it's a translation of um, taking something that is a complex topic and then simplifying it so that everyone is able to understand it and gain that knowledge. But then uh, what was really fascinating is how World War II kind of impacted this project. And uh, Isabel Briggs Myers, she believed that if people understood each other better, they'd work better together and there would be less conflict. And so that's why she started doing this research. And, you know, 
I really like kind of understanding the why of things. And so when I, again, when I dug into this, I, I was super fascinated by it. And so she basically wanted to make the world a better place. And so uh, she spent, you know, many, many years putting together and doing this research. And that's where the original Myers-Briggs type indicator, the MBTI instrument was created in 1962. And then there have been updates since then. And so there are a ton of tools available. Um, I personally like 16 personalities because I, I have a degree in technical communications and I took a lot of visual document design courses. And so um, I had each and every student board of directors member uh, go through their 16 personalities type to kind of just learn more about their individual selves uh, and understand how they interact with the world and what their personality looks like. And so I will say, this is a beautiful guide but it's not a hard and fast rule. And so people you know, can change. Uh, when you are in high school, this will be different from when you are in college or when you're in your career or when you go through major life events. Um, so I really encourage people to kind of do this more than once. Uh, I have been three different personality types over the ages because I had one area that kind of flipped back and forth. Um, but then on my 29th birthday, I took the test again and that's kind of where I am now. Um, and so, it basically they break down these different traits. And so it goes from um, how you interact with the environment. So the idea of being uh, introverted or extroverted, uh, your energy. So where you direct your mental energy. So are you, you know, uh, intuitively interacting with the, this, you know, world or are you observing it uh, nature so that's how you are making decisions coping with emotions so thinking versus feeling tactics um, how you plan things so judging or prospecting and then uh, confidence in your abilities and so that can be assertive or turbulent and so when you kind of go through these tests they'll figure out you know which types you are based on these various questions and the 16 personalities will give you these percentages but I thought it was important to kind of break down these different ideas and share with you, you know, what these actually mean uh, as you work on them. So if we start with the mind, introverted and extroverted, um, I found this really fascinating because I feel like a lot of people in the world don't actually understand what it means to be introverted or extroverted. Um, it isn't that, you know, you don't like people or you don't like being around people or you always want to be around people um, or you're loud or boisterous. Um, it's just how you are able to, uh, it's, it's your reaction to external stimulation. So introverts really recharge on their own, like within the quiet of their own mind. And they are energized by spending time alone. I kind of compare it to, you know, filling a cup. So this is a concept that people have talked about before where, as an extrovert myself, I need to engage with people around me uh, because I will be feel drained if I'm spending too much time alone. Whereas introverts uh, feel drained after a large group of, t of activities and they need to be more introspective in order to fill their cup back up and uh, be able and ready to engage again with the world. And so it was, it was interesting because they talked about introverts being sensitive to noise and extroverts potentially more likely not you know a hard and fast rule but more likely to wear brighter colorful clothing um and i thought that that was really interesting but then my scientific and technical nerdy self was like well why is this and how does this work and so then i started reading about the reticular activating system um and i started like discovering all of this fantastic scientific concepts and the psychological explanation behind these different things and um, found this wonderful photo that is not my photo um, and I've cited it kind of at the bottom here, but basically explaining, you know, these different pieces. And then I was like, okay, well, I don't really want to sit here and quote, you know, the textbook of clinical neurology that says, you know, the RAS system is a network of neurons located in the brainstem, blah, 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 blah because you all can read this. And I'm also talking a little quickly, so I'll try to slow down. But what I did is I made a really simple explanation because as someone who likes to translate complicated uh, pieces and has a degree in scientific and technical communication, a bachelor of science degree in that, um, but I'm neither a doctor nor have I studied psychology, this is how I translated that. And so basically you have these inputs, so visual, audio, you know, your other senses, and 
your brain processes that information. And then what comes in, because you can kind of see these outputs here in the orange arrows. So this information is coming in. Uh, your RAS system is the one that's kind of processing, you know, what's going on, and then you're reacting as outputs. And so that's where your fight or flight, you know, reaction, some sort of physical action, you know, yelling, crying, like could come out from that regard. So when you break it down, if you, this is, this is an ear. So if you hear a sound and it's a pillow because it's a soft sound, really literal here. Um, so you have this input coming into your brain and it's going through your RAS system and the output it between like no reaction versus a reaction for an introvert is basically, um, you know, you'll, you'll have a reaction and it'll be more of a reaction than an extrovert. So they're just a little bit more sensitive uh, and in terms of, you know, audio or other stimulation around them. So if there is a loud noise, like think Cotton Eye Joe at robotics events, you know, that's, that's a little bit too loud. Um, then the feedback that an introvert would have from no reaction to an, you know, an intense reaction is kind of way on that other spectrum where an extrovert is just kind of comfortably sitting in the middle. And so I thought it was really important as we were kind of going through these different concepts to just kind of explain that like, the way people, introverts and extroverts think and process things um, isn't necessarily associated with like how they like to socialize with people. Like there is actually, you know, pieces and systems and processes going on in their brain. That means that the stimulation around them, uh, you know, you're reacting to it in different ways. And I thought, I thought this was fascinating. Um, again, I am not a doctor and I've not studied psychology. And so someone else will need to go into more detail with this, but I spent a significant amount of time today learning about this um, because I was just kind of nerding out about it. And hopefully it's been presented in a way that explains, you know, that, that introverts, you know, are social and can interact with people and extroverts aren't always boisterous or, you know, super outgoing, but they, this is how they get their energy. And that I thought was really important for our, our teams to understand. So let's talk about energy now. So this is where the intuitive, AKA N versus observant, AKA S kind of comes in. And so uh, this is how you see the world. And so if you're intuitive, uh, you kind of have, the descriptors are, you know, visionary, you can work with abstract concepts, uh, you appreciate novelty, you focus on what's possible and use your imagination. And you're kind of thinking about these possibilities. So where you can thrive is brainstorming. Uh, and, it, you know, when you communicate, you're, it's easy for you to read between the lines. But if, and if you're observant, you know, you're very factual, concrete. Uh, you know, I think of a lot of engineers around this area because they focus on what's real, what's going on in the present moment. You know, they think about this in terms of uh, data. And when they communicate, the focus is on facts and practical you know, matters. And so I think it's really important to kind of understand those different concepts, because the more you can understand about yourself and how you react, you'll understand where other people are coming from as well. So nature focuses on thinking versus feeling. And so thinking uh, in terms of these decision making aspects and how you cope with emotions, uh, when you're thinking based, you do decision making around log logical and rational arguments. So like brain over heart. And when you, and you absolutely have emotions, but you safeguard and manage those emotions. You consistently, your motto is kind of like, you want to keep a cool head and you can override the emotional response you might have to something with rational logic, which I find really impressive because I'm absolutely feeling. Uh, and so from a decision-making point of view, uh, they're following their hearts uh, in terms of their emotions and how they cope with them. They feel like they can show and share emotions. They're compassionate and sensitive. Um, and uh, they will uh, fight tooth and nail for a lot of their beliefs. So looking at tactics, so that's where judging versus prospecting comes in. Uh, this is how people approach planning. 
Uh, and so I feel like a lot of times this is where you can get conflict in groups because when you have people who are kind of under this judging area, they uh, really like to understand all of the different uh, contingency plans that are available to them. They would like a plan, they wanna stick to the plan, they wanna cross things off their list uh, and they have a really strong work ethic. But when it comes to prospecting, the approach to planning is flexible and relaxed. Um, you're looking for opportunities and options. You see the possibilities that are available and you don't necessarily want to commit to something uh, that means, you know, it might be in, not a great option in the future. And so you kind of have those two different focuses in terms of planning. And then your identity is something that underpins all of these various aspects. And so that's where this uh, confidence in your abilities and decisions comes in. And I have to say, I definitely, when I did these uh, surveys previously, I was, I was a turbulent you know, person. So I wasn't as confident in my abilities. And so as I've grown and as I've become more confident in myself, I've you know, adjusted to be more assertive. And so when you're assertive, you have this, um, you're self-assured, even tempered, resistant to stress. Um, you don't necessarily push too hard to achieve goals, which can be detrimental, um, but you're not spending time thinking about past actions. And then when you're turbulent, you know, that typically means that you're sensitive to stress, you're very success driven, um, eager to improve, which can be great. Uh, you care about outcomes and these achieving goals and you think deeply about where you wanna go in life. And so whenever you're picking and seeing these different options, neither one of them, you know, one is not better or worse than the other. Uh, they're just ways that you process and function and you kind of process your identity. So I thought it was, this is, I think incredibly helpful when it comes to, you know, working together with these different groups. Um, but then in terms of bringing these groups together, I think one of the most helpful uh, charts that was ever put together um, kind of explains these personality groupings. And so uh, you have the analysts that really focus on these, this intuitive um, and thinking personality, whereas uh, diplomats, for instance, really focus on um, feeling so they're, they're intuitive, but they also have that feeling aspects, which, which is the difference there. And then sentinels have an obje observing and judging are the shared personality aspects. And then explorers focus on, you know, observing and prospecting. And so you can see in this chart, we've kind of, I've broken down the different descriptors of each one. And then because we had our student board of directors go through each of these, I gathered all of their data um, and determined what were the different types and personalities for a student board of directors. And so what does this mean for y'all? So here's what we did. So I had nine students fill this out and I found that we had, uh, it was kind of funny, two main groupings. So we had seven diplomats uh, and two sentinels and I broke each dent one based on area and then showed you all what the personalities were. And so you can see we have a lot of advocates um, and then everyone else was pretty unique in terms of some of these different uh, personalities. And so maybe one flipped, you know, back and forth, but I thought it was really fascinating um, how many of you had this feeling based um, interaction, you know, feeling versus thinking, uh, and then even the, you know, turbulent versus assertive was kind of an interesting prospect as well. And so this was the breakdown of the data for the student board of directors, which again, the reason we're sharing this is because this is what you could do with your robotics team. Um, and so student board of directors, we're gonna go into some questions a little bit later, but you can see I summarized all of the information in this chart. And so this is a summary of our various student board of directors. So looking at every single, you know, introverted versus extroverted, you know, aspects, um, I think it was really interesting because what I found is that out of the nine of you, seven of you, uh, when you interact with people, you need personal time to go back and recharge. Um, so, you know, in terms of doing activities, when we look at this as a student board, we probably should make sure that we have like breaks in between large group activities so you are able to recharge. Um, in terms of directing mental energy, uh, we, we're very focused on the intuitive aspect versus the observant aspect. And so when you kind of go over that area, you know, what that tells us is that we want to make sure, one, we're balanced. And so our observant, you know, contacts on the team, we need to make sure that we 
focus on, we remember to focus on what's real because majority of us uh, in this group are, you know, kind of these big thinkers thinking about all the possibilities, but we also need to remember to be realistic. And so we have to be balanced in terms of those different aspects. Um, when it comes to nature, again, predominantly feeling. Um, and so we can remember that, um, that we can be logical and rational. And sometimes uh, when our feelings gets better of us, we need to remember that we do not have a Tyrannosaurus Rex chasing after us. Instead, they are just large chickens. Um, and so then you just imagine chickens chasing you and suddenly the world becomes a better place. Uh, and so that's kind of a concept that we can make sure to apply into, but also remember that our cohort who has that, that you know thinking aspect, like they have feelings too, and we need to be compassionate. And so then when you look at the tactics piece of it, um, judging versus prospecting, they really focus on you know, this approach to planning. And so uh, our student board of directors love planning, love planning. They like knowing exactly what's going to happen next. And um, what that tells me is that instead of winging it, I should really make sure that I have my PowerPoints done ahead of time um, so that I am not anxiety, introducing anxiety into their lives by having them wing it on a video, which is what this next part is. Uh, because I definitely have a prospecting aspect and, and I thank you for your being flexible when you are not inherently always comfortable with that. Uh, and then on, when you talk about identity, you know, this is where I think it's very clear that you're still kind of building up your confidence. Um, and I did not have a breakdown of like what your backgrounds were. So we did this, it was blind. Um, and so it, it just is very general. I don't necessarily know who's who, but um, I think that doing some confidence building could be good um, for the group. And it's not because being turbulent is a bad thing. Uh, it just means that it might be well served to make sure that you are confident in your decisions to remove some of the inherent stress that comes from it. And so uh, that's what I'm getting from your chart and the information and what our student board of directors looks like. Um, and so I have this really cool uh, little Google Doc copy, uh, which I swear I had. Okay, well, that's exciting. One second. We'll see if we can open this up. Um, here we go. So you can see here uh, that we had created the Finn family, uh, made a copy of the 16 personalities, you know, team comparison chart. So we just invented this. Um, super shout out to Purdue First Programs for one of their students helping to put together. Um, the the data so Brittany thank you so much uh, but basically what it is is once you type in your personality type uh, this automatically pulls in what personality group are you so analyst diplomat sentinel or explorer uh, what the specific name of that personality type is and then the summary of it so you have everything easy to see you know right at your fingers and then I had added a couple extra places you can delete or remove or adjust this as needed but I also included my workplace appreciation languages, also known as love languages, um, but for the workplace, uh, my communication preferences, so in person or phone, because I am a millennial, but evidently that means I am getting old uh, and I prefer in person and phone communications. And then uh, triggers are things that people should be aware of. And so one of them for me is that I appreciate reminders and check-ins on if I've had food. And not everyone likes that, uh, but I will get so like focused on something that I will just forget to eat. Um, and I love food and I want to eat food, but I just forget. And so uh, having people help remind me of that or letting people know I don't mind that reminder is helpful. So going back to the presentation, yes, it worked. Um, so if you have every student and mentor fill out a line in the chart, um, you can basically compile this information and then have a you know this discussion. You know, go through these different traits as a team, and you can identify ways to resolve conflict between these different personality groups. And then that's where you can ask these fun, far-reaching questions, like we did with the student board of directors. You know, talking about what problems do you want to solve in the world, uh, what brings you joy, you know, things like that. And so. So from this perspective, you know, student board of directors, uh, in terms of resolving conflict, I think, you know, we kind of just broke down these different aspects of the student board of directors. You all know what your personality type is. 
uh, what were some kind of core things you learned from the review of this data so far? I think kind of like just to note before, um, like MBTI is like, like kind of how you said like personality types change a lot. So that the met it's important to note that the metrics that they measure um, are very dependent on what kind of environment you're in. So mm -hmm. like, um, like a lot of us are turbulent, which is like noted in like um, us being high schoolers and like we have a lot of stress and like just noting like those kinds of like trends in like how your outside factors impact that personality type is really important to acknowledge. But um, as for the student board of directors, I would say for like resolving conflict, we're all pretty um, good communicators as is, but um, we're always, I think, rather than like compromising, we usually collaborate to find a better solution, which I think is actually a really uh, helpful thing that we've been all been able to do. But we're also very lucky that everyone's very um, like intelligent about the way they communicate and how we work together. No, absolutely. And Priya, did you have something you wanted to add but with some of the other slides that we were yeah, going over? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just like the thing about like when like your team members take this test like and you're ex assessing that information, um, just like know that like um, like for like the introverted slash extroverted, like at a competition, how would a lot of your members react at like all the loud noises and like, um, or would they really be a good person to be in the pits? And just, but like a lot of those things are really dependent on different environments. So just like keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, and it's even, you know, if you're introverted, you know, and you spend, a, and you're, you know, you're a pit person, you're going to be in the pits. Um, I think, you know, just knowing or being aware that then they might need a break. Like instead of going straight to the stands, being able to go to a quiet room for, you know, 20 minutes would maybe be um, really helpful versus going straight to the stands where everything is loud. So that could be kind of a way to, to use that information to help. Okay. So does anyone else have any other kind of aspects where they can really see this helping their team um, or even as a student board. I know half of you, you know, you're graduating um, and transitioning, um, but I know we have, you know, two of our newer students coming in. Um, are there any thoughts about how this could help? Or if you had known this ahead of time, how this could have, you know, helped the student board this past year? Um, so I know this is, more for like teams personally, but a lot of times it gets really stressful in the beginning of build season, like with kickoff, trying to keep everything organized. So I feel like knowing whether people are either like judging or prospecting kind of personalities, kind of keeping that in mind so that way you can kind of lessen tension because people obviously have different ways of thinking. So it'd be good to know how people go about planning stuff. And if they're more of like the dream big or they're more of like, strict on schedules than to know that so that way there are not too many arguments or tension building during the beginning of field season. Uh, kind, of what Bella, kind of what Bella was talking about with like how people react. I think um, regardless of like MBTI or whatever, just knowing how your team members are going to react to anything is probably a good idea just because like um, when you're always like it depends on like how you want to present yourself as a leader because um, the best way you can help your members slash coworkers um, is really knowing the best way they're going to receive what kind of vision you're trying to pay the path for. So um, a kind of like what Renee was saying about like, um, like being intuitive or like being observant, like knowing how people are going to process information from you is really important because you're the one giving it out. I definitely agree. I mean, understanding people, I think, is a big part of trust that we were kind of talking about earlier. And also knowing yourself more, I think, is huge to know, oh, maybe I handle this situation different than somebody else on my team. But being able to know yours and theirs and be able to make a compromise or uh, collaborate, I think that's a really big deal. And just kind of like understanding yourself and your teammates is really um, pretty big. So I think this would be a really helpful thing to do as a team, like in the fall, gearing up for the season so that it's like a fun thing that everybody can do. And especially with the 16 personalities, it's really cool because they have characters and compare like 
famous people that are like you. So it's a really cool program. Um, a lot of what I know about MBTI, I learned a, a little bit ago because over the summer, our team went to the Triangle Fraternity Conference that they have. Um, and one of the speakers there um, talked about MBTI for a couple minutes. And he talked about how different personality types, um, when you are forming a group, you should form a group that has all as many different personality types as possible. I th and I think that would be something that can be super applicable to teams because you it's easier to form a project when there's so many different perspectives and when there's so many different personalities present. And while there may be conflicting ideas um, with, with just the every single type of personality, there's some form of just communication that can happen between them to come to one um, consensus. And that can be the best for most people because of how many different personalities are represented in that idea. Absolutely. And that, there's, like, there's a lot of research out there that says when you can bring a diverse group of people together, um, the better you'll, the, the better whatever you're producing or creating or designing or thinking about will be because everyone is able to come from these different aspects. And So when you look at this, um, what do you like, you know, Priya, I really loved your example about how you could actually like use this information to build a schedule for someone um, who might be a little bit more introverted to allow them to kind of like take breaks after working in the pit. Um, does anyone have any ideas on, um, you know, tangible things that you could do with your team, you know, knowing some more about those different students um, and those kind of like aspects? What do you think? I mean, even like um, what um, I, I don't remember who just said it, Sam or Bella was saying about um, creating um, a group of diverse people, just being able to make concessions for different types of people, um, I think is really important in general, just because like um, when you're able to be more empathetic and more um, understanding of how other people think about certain things, um, I think you'll be able to they'll be able to trust you a little bit more so like an example would be like um let's say uh like in a design process decision if only like certain people speak up and not a lot of other people speak up uh giving those people an opportunity to um seem more approachable or um, a lot of different ways to bring in all those ideas on a diverse group of people <laughs> And even knowing that it might take them a little bit more time to like process, you know, to the, the they're, they're taking time to really think through and like provide their answer. Um, and so just having an extra, you know, couple seconds where you pause and, find, you know, see if anyone else would like to add anything, you know, that can be helpful too. So with that regard, again, kind of thinking at it from, you know, a team point of view, something that you could look at as is um, when you're working with someone who had kind of has here, let's actually, I'm going to go backwards a little bit um, and show kind of this breakdown. Um, yeah, of like the different areas. So when you're working with maybe, um, you know, you're working on the entrepreneurship award, and you have an analyst uh, who is very focused on this uh, intellectual excellence, they're very rational, um, they have a very thinking oriented mindset versus the, uh, like an explorer who's more uh, spontaneous, um, they're living in the moment. So a conflict that could occur is, um, you know, the analyst is very focused on the data. The explorer is very focused on uh, the, you know, just kind of like resolving the challenges in the moment as they come up. And so there could be a potential conflict there and being able to take a step back and know, hey, our ultimate goal, which is all the way up here, is we are looking to, you know, complete and submit the most robust entrepreneurship award um, ever. And, you know, we're coming at it from two different angles, this very data driven oriented aspect uh, and a very, um, you know, uh, spontane spontaneous aspect, but you're both going to the same goal. So kind of taking that step back and saying, I have a different way of getting there, but we are trying to reach the same spot and I can respect that. So how can we work together versus in conflict to get there? 
a part of like um like the team process i guess is like in the beginning when you work with like all of your people is that you're setting your goals together so that your vision starts out together so like if people are um if it's unclear by um like whatever like entrepreneurship was your example by the time the award is being developed that um both people don't have the same goal then you're kind of just either both parties or at least one party will be upset and i feel like that kind of defeats the purpose so it's really important to remember even just like before you start any project or even at the beginning of the year you understand um what your like main team goals or subgroup goals are and you set those together to kind of know um like hey like i was part of setting up this goal like i can't go back on it now like kind of understanding different personal stakes in what you want you and your teammates to achieve is really important, no matter how you get there. But that needs to all kind of happen before you get started though. And adding a little to what Priya said, it's also like, you have to make sure that you respect those people as well, not just the fact that um, you're working with them, but just the fact that they're willing to trust you enough to let you know their personality that kind of sense because it's a lot for a lot of people it might be more like personal for them so making sure that you establish like we said before the the trust um in your own sub team whether um it be for an award or just you know for a project um is really good to like have that before you begin a project otherwise it might it's probably just going to fall apart because of lack of communication and trust and i think especially in frc um we rush a lot just because when you're in a four-year um time frame you have such a high learning curve to catch up to that you're constantly when you're like kind of grinding for all these skills to be achieved for the robot deadline for whatever chairman's deadline you kind of lose sight of all these foundational elements and once those get skipped they kind of snowball and then there's other consequences so it's important for like, especially like mentors and leadership members that you don't lose sight of kind of the magic of what this program is able to provide for us, which is the ability to be mentored and to mentor. And through kind of remembering in the beginning to set those goals with your team to be more understanding of your team members, you can have a better project in the end because you guys are all in it together and you have more trust, I guess is like the kind of the basis of this conversation anyway. And how do you, so I think that all of these different pieces can kind of come together to really build a program that can thrive because you're building a team and kind of a foundation, um, you know, that trusts each other, that understands each other and from understanding comes trust. And so I think that you know, this aspect and these opportunities are tools and techniques that these teams can use. But I also just wonder um, how do you, how do you take this example that we've provided, you know, to teams and how can they kind of make their programs thrive from that? So I was on a team with a hundred plus people. And when you're with so many people and trying to manage so many people, you really lose sight of like um, with only um, seven leaders and also like five mentors. Um, you start to lose sight of the whole, the mass amount of people that you're trying to just manage and just do all the paperwork for. But kind of like the whole like walking a mile in someone's shoes. Um, once you're able to take time as a leader to really get to know everyone around you, you start to see the better parts of them just from spending more time with them. And once they see that you're taking the time to be there for them, um, I think that's a really important um, role that you can play for people to kind of make those concessions and be more empathetic. I totally agree with Priya. I think um, being a leader is all about uh, the people that you're working with and making relationships with them and um, making sure that they feel safe and that they're taken care of in addition to um, making like a safe environment for everybody but doing things that you're never too big enough for like small things in leadership. So you should always show the people that you're leading that every, like you are just as valid as they are and um, give them tools to work with. So a leader is kind of just somebody who is 
helping a group of people and it's not you have to realize that it's not all about you so it's about the people that you're working with and how to make it the best for them to grow so yeah and I go ahead Devin okay I just I was gonna agree with that I think the most important thing you can do as a leader is listen to the people you're leading because that's how you're going to learn about their concerns so you can help make them more comfortable and that's how you're going to learn about their strengths so you know when to call on them. That's a really good way to be able to delegate tasks. And I think that's, I mean, that's the job of a leader is to make sure everybody's involved and everybody's learning and growing together. Awesome. I, when you guys are talking, I feel like you're talking a lot about compassion. Um, and so, you know, uh, sorry, I think someone's talking in the background. I don't know if it's that loud. But anyway, uh, so the Dalai Lama, one of the quotes that they have is that um, first, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. And the second quote is that if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And if you want to be happy, practice compassion. And so when what I'm hearing you guys talk about, when you talk about, you know, getting to know people, understanding people, walking in their shoes, it just sounds a lot like, you know, compassion. Um, and so when you're a leader, what does it mean to kind of remember to not just look at your point of view, to need to look at a lot of different views. And how do you bring compassion to the, your teams? I think like kind of the first step for me because I got into leadership fairly quickly was that like to remember, especially my freshman year, um, the leader I wanted to be led by. So kind of like lead by example is kind of cliche, but um, just, like, what do you wish that your younger, more inexperienced self could have? Because we're um, all pretty, some, we all come from the same, uh, we're all in robotics. We all have this kind of the same mission here. So having um, to be someone that you wish you were, like be your best self really. Um, and that will kind of show, I think, because first, as we know, isn't just about building robots, it's about be building people. And the more you can do to instill better values like compassion, empathy, um, understanding, um, like even like conflict resolution, whatever, like all of those um, values that you can uh, kind of create in yourself, um, that'll kind of, that's contagious. And that when you have a team that's all like that and has those core values, um, it really shows in the results of your work. Dang it. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm going to scroll down here um, because if there are any questions from the live stream, you know, feel free to post them. Um, we can definitely kind of keep going from there. But uh, we're about three minutes or two minutes from the break now. Did you do you have any final thoughts about uh, your personality type, like what you filled out? Like, were there any surprises or things that you thought were really interesting about kind of those different pieces? Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was when, after you finish the test, it gives you like the whole personality, like, like the deep dive of like what it means. Um, and I thought the most interesting part of mine was the, just the career portion, like what it thought that like, I should, I should like be when I grow up and stuff like that. Um, a lot of what it talked about was being a counselor and being somebody that people can go to, to talk to. And I think it was interesting, not necessarily because that was the path that I looked for in my life with like a career, I'd never thought about it in that way, but I think it was really interesting that, that it just, it was really interesting that my personality type just like recognized a lot of the values that I do hold and that that ability to like be able to like be somebody that people can talk to, which was really important to me. And I thought that was interesting. Awesome. I'm INFJ, which is the advocate, which I found to be very appropriate because I want to do advocacy work. Um, I've always kind of, I've taken this test a bunch of times um, throughout the years, and I've noticed um, I tend to hover more in the middle for all of my percentages, um, but as I've gotten older and I've taken it more recently, it has started to shift towards more definitive things, and so I think it's really interesting because it's 
doing that as I'm trying to determine what I want to be doing with my life and as I'm answering Renee's question about what problem I want to solve and kind of becoming more definitive and reflecting what I what my future plans are so I think that's really cool all right so I do I know we're ready for break um, I did just want to share this is kind of what your profile looks like um, so this is mine I'm an assertive uh, protagonist and I'm in the role of a diplomat and my strategy is people mastery and so what I thought is really interesting though is you know Devin exactly what you were saying uh, I did not used to be 93% extroverted and you know as of my 29th birthday like that's where I'm at and so um, there are still areas like under tactics where judging versus prospecting um, I can switch I can switch to prospecting like these are spectrums they're not hard and fast rules um, but I thought like these were some of these kind of like interesting pieces um, you know I was especially interested I always like the feeling versus thinking um, you know information and then the identity piece of it um, as well. So that's kind of what my information is. Uh, my information is also in the example uh, that teams are welcome to kind of utilize. Um, but this is generally my breakdown um, and where we are. And it's funny because I used to be, um, depending on how comfortable I was, if I was relaxed, I was an explorer, the entertainer. And then if I um, was a little bit more stressed um, or like you know, at, in a professional work setting, I was the counsel. So I would kind of swap between um, these in, intuitive settings um, and essentially go, you know, back and forth. But then I really defined myself down, um, you know, over to this diplomat role. So, all right, Chris, I think you have a few other pieces um, that you are able to share for our break. And then we'll be coming back here at approximately 5.30 uh, to introduce our uh, good friend, Evan Hotenstein. Hotenstein, sorry, Evan, you're gonna have to help me with uh, your last name still, all these years later, um, who's gonna talk about saving lives with 3D printing. So thanks everybody. Um, students, you're welcome to kind of stay and ask questions to Evan, um, but we'll be back at 5.30 after a break. And so we have a couple uh, awesome little bits videos, photos, things, a thing that was created to show during this break. So take it away, Chris. Great. Thank you, Renee. Uh, thank you, student board and everybody for that great presentation. Yeah, we're moving on to our break right now. Uh, we've got a really nice uh, PowerPoint presentation, um, pictures from this year and last. Uh, it'll be rotating for everybody to watch. We've got uh, representation of every team in the state. So here we go. Enjoy. Thanks, Chris.
We are back from break. We have uh, just about one minute left. We've got uh, Renee uh, joining us again here in a moment uh, with uh, our guest this evening, Evan Folkstein, who will be joining us. All right. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. That sounds great. A lot of great pictures from our uh, media crew over the last year or two. Yeah. And they do a fantastic job. They really do. That was really awesome. All right. Special thanks to Monica. I think she's she made that, right? Yeah, and all the photographers and Hugh Meyer, our, our media director for First Indian Robotics and, and everybody who worked so hard. So I'll let you guys go. I'll mute. All right. Thanks, Chris. Hi, Evan. How are you doing? Hey, Renee. I'm doing uh, just about as fine as uh, anyone could be in uh, kind of the chaos that's COVID-19 right now. Absolutely. So do you... Uh, um, so why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction? I think we've known each other since 2009, 10, I don't know. It's, it's like been a while. It has been a while. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we, uh, I think we first met on Chief Delphi when you were asking, uh, who needs help with chairman's awards? So. Yes. I think I came and mentored your <laughs> robotics team. I think I made Danny drive me over there. Um, so for sure. everyone watching, fun fact, Evan was a groomsman in um, our wedding. So Danny's Hi, Danny. giving a thumbs up. Evan's saying hello. All right. So Evan, um, you know, this is a really crazy time, but, uh, you know, if we're going to be given lemons, then we should make some lemonade. And I found it really interesting talking with you um, about what your workload kind of looks like and just what you do um, as a healthcare solutions engineer at Stratasys. And so I was hoping you could kind of give me an overview of, you know, what you do, what that looks like, and then also what are you doing now? Um, and you're welcome to take it in whatever direction you really want. Um, but feel free to go from there. And then we kept a couple of student board of directors members on the line. Um, and then we will grab questions from Chris uh, via our Twitch stream after that. So feel free to take it from here. Absolutely. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, so that, that was a great introduction. But I, my name is Evan Hochstein. Um, I am a healthcare solutions engineer at Stratasys. We are a 3D printing company based out of uh, uh, two locations, actually, Eden Prairie, Minnesota, which is kind of in that Twin Cities area where our capital is, and then also Rehovot, Israel. Uh, so we do have dual headquarters. We are an international company. I mean, we have probably 40 different offices throughout the world. <laughs> So as you can imagine, um, having being such a, a large multinational company, we are uh, concentrating a lot of efforts on COVID-19 release now. Many of our offers or offices are currently shelter in place, uh, which means that many of our employees cannot leave their office or can, cannot leave their home. Uh, if you're looking behind me here, you'll notice I'm in the office. We do have a shelter in place order here in Minnesota as well. Um, however, it doesn't go into effect until tomorrow. And this office will be remaining open to actually start or continue to manufacture uh, some supplies for the, the medical industry. Um, that's kind of been our, our really our goal the last two weeks here in the U.S., but our, our European offices, our Israeli offices, as well as our um, uh, Asian offices have been uh, pretty much this has been their life for the, the past two months uh, where they've been trying to manufacture uh, medical equipment to help protect our, our healthcare workers. Uh, since it's such a hot topic, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about COVID-19 and, and really what you can go do to help from a 3D printing aspect. And then I'll, uh, and then I'll go into a little bit about more about what Stratasys actually does in the healthcare industry and uh, where, where we really think where there are some cool applications. Uh, so to start off, you might have seen it in the news. You might have seen it on the internet. Uh, we are manufacturing these face visors, so or I should say uh, face shields. Uh, there are two components to it, really: the, the visor on top, which is gray, and then the shield itself, which is a clear plastic. Uh, the 3D printed portion of it is the visor uh, in gray material. Here we're printing them in multiple uh, colors. The shield itself is a PET G material, is what we're looking at here. It's 40 thousandths in thickness. We're also manufacturing them actually out of build sheets that we use for our 3D printers at 20 thousandths thickness. So trying to really use the materials we have on hand to get these out to our healthcare community as fast as possible. We've actually partnered with many of our customers. Uh, that list is still being compiled. We've had over uh, 500 companies at this point reach out asking us, hey, how can we help? How can, you, can we use our Stratasys 3D printers to manufacture uh, equipment to support the healthcare community? 
Uh, so that, that was just one idea. That's something that's, uh, you know, on the, um, in our press releases today, there are many projects that I'm continuing to work on and, and kind of what I would call my part-time or outside of the eight hours I'm at work trying to start a kickoff manufacturing between about uh, 600 different facilities manufacturing just that visor. But we're looking at uh, face masks. So there's been a lot of talk about N95 face masks in industry and being able to print those. Uh, it's very difficult to 3D print N95 masks. This is the copper 3D design here. Here's another design I have over here on my left. Um, these are face masks. They cannot be N95 validated unless they go through specific uh, testing that's uh, been approved by the government. Uh, the FDA is releasing a lot of information on a day-to-day -day basis, but how do we go through approvals for this? What's an emergency use declaration? And all of these technical terms and uh, about 40-page documents that I've been asked to go through haven't gotten to it yet. I'm looking forward to it, though. And how do we actually, from a 3D printing industry, manufacture this equipment as fast as possible to get it out to the supply uh, of, the, of these hospitals? Because 3M is doing everything they can to manufacture these. Honeywell, uh, Medtronic wants to manufacture ventilators. They're working with Tesla, as I'm sure many of you have seen on the news. Uh, but how do we manufacture them faster and how do we manufacture more of them? Because if you really look at that curve today and how that curve is uh, trending within the United States, we're going to be overwhelming our, our, our health system very, very quickly. Um, so that's a, a pretty large summary of, of kind of our efforts today, very high level. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved, you can always sign up at stratasys.com. Uh, if you go to stratasys.com, I'm sure there's a button that says on the front page, it says like reach out or contact us. Uh, it's super easy. It's probably the first button you see there. I know our marketing team is working hard on making it easy and effective to to work with us. So I guess any any questions on that, uh, Renee or anyone else? Absolutely. So um, I'm actually pulling it up now. So I'm going to steal your screen and share um, over on my second screen here. Um, so we can quick, so we can take a look here. Um, so this is where the Stratasys website is, um, need supplies, capacity to help do your organization of 3D printing capacity. And then there's this reach out button here. Um, and then they, this is the face shield frame file. And so, you know, Evan, you're hundred percent correct. Your marketing team is on it. Yeah. So if you, um, if, it, if you'll keep that up for a second, Renee, I want to. Yes, I will bring it back. Else. Yes. <laughs> Thank there you. There we go. No problem. Um, so the the reach out button you can click, but uh, I think even easier than that, if you go down and click the download face shield frames uh, files, yeah, that's the button. Um, here you're going to see there's a, there's a, some instructions, very basic instructions on how to put this together. I think I put these together on Sunday. We're working on some better instructions that aren't from an engineer or from uh, a marketing professional that know how to put that sort of stuff together. But if you click a face shield manufacturing package, you'll notice that we have revision three that was just up, uploaded by myself, not 15 minutes ago. Um, what this is, is it's going to include the STL file, the step file. So you can, you know, remix the design yourself. It'll include some manufacturing guidelines, some suggested information on if you want to manufacture these shields yourself, uh, the thickness of the material you should be using, uh, the, the, the specific, the DXF and the step file of the shield file itself. Um, the coolest part about the, the visor is that the visor is meant to interface with anything as simple as even a transparency sheet that you would use on old overhead projectors, probably dating myself a little bit there, that are just simply three hole punched with a standard three hole punch. Fantastic. So, um, Evan, I know that there are a lot of messages um, or a lot of people who are kind of sending out information, you know, trying to help. Um, when Stratasys was working on this, I know you guys had to go through a lot of different, um, you know, testing, uh, editing, adjusting, you know, et cetera. So for people who want to help, what are the really critical things to keep in mind to make sure people are helping and they're not producing products that are not actually usable? Yep. So I would say, number one, the most important thing is understand the regulation and understand that a lot of these uh, objects that are being printed are going to be used to help save lives. So we don't want to create something that's going to cause detriment to life. Uh, you know, there's all of this information going on right now about respirators and ventilators and 3D printing them. There's a lot of validation that needs to go into printing these to ensure that when we actually put them at, at the point of care at a hospital and hook them up to a patient, it, it's not going to cause adverse effects. Um, we want to make sure that we're, you know, providing a higher level of care. We're not harming the patient in any way. 
So it's always important to think that uh, think about that. Uh, the easiest thing to do right now is, is face shields. Uh, it's a relatively inert device that you can just, you know, slide over your face. It sits there. It's disposable. Uh, we know we've been working with a couple of hospitals that are actually, they've taken our visors. We made our first sh shipment yesterday. They're using them for one patient, and then they're tossing them and, and taking out another. The reason being is they're trying to keep their uh, staff safe. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind as well. Excellent. Uh, can you, so thank you for giving us that overview about where we are just in the world right now. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, how you found yourself to be where you are today? Um, I, you have a really interesting backstory and I think that a lot of people would be kind of inspired to hear from where you started, what you did, and then we kind of know where you are now, but t walk us through that process. Absolutely. Uh, it's not a not an easy process to walk through, but I'll, I'll do my best here. So I was a student on a FRC team here in, in Minnesota, uh, team number 2470, back when they were called Blitz team. Uh, they are a pink team, so uh, we always wear pink shirts. Uh, they were awesome. I was a student president of the team back in uh, 2010. I graduated in uh, 2010. And then I, of course, I immediately went back to be a mentor and uh, encountered a lot of challenges as a uh, college mentor. Uh, I think the most interesting fact about that is I was going to a community college for the first year and a half after I graduated. And then I took a semester off just to mentor my robotics team. Not saying you should do that ever. Um, it, was, it was an adventure. I would encourage everybody to stay in college. Um, but it, it was just something that happened to work for me at the time. And I will tell you, I learned a lot and it was a very valuable experience to go through that for me. Um, but you kind of have to be in the right position at the right time for that to happen. After I took that semester off, I actually changed colleges. I went to a local college, uh, a local tech school called Dunwoody College of uh, Engineering and Technology. I started a degree there that was for uh, robotics, something or other. Um, essentially, you know, the you see the robot arms in industry moving and, and helping to manufacture goods. It was a course to, uh, to help students uh, work into that industry. Uh, I quickly found out about the first week that that was not the program for me, and I, I switched over to electrical engineering technology, and I started proceeding down that path. So I went to uh, Dunwoody for my associate's degree for two years. I did not graduate. Um, I was one class short. I could not finish that last class. just wasn't a class that uh, really clicked with me. Um, but I, at the same time, I got an uh, internship with a local robotics company. Uh, and I, I worked there for a year and started gaining some really powerful 3D printing experience, which I got my foot in the door here at Stratasys as a uh, technical support representative. That meant I was uh, primarily on the phone every day when I first started here at Stratasys, um, talking with our customers, emailing with our customers, uh, sitting down with them, sometimes visiting their sites, fixing their 3D printers, helping them be more effective uh, in running their 3D printers as, as often as possible. Uh, that was uh, a, another really great learning experience for me. Uh, I found out that, hey, I've always thought I wanted to be an engineer. I always thought that that was my end goal in life, but I learned that there are so many different types of engineers. There are R&D engineers, and there are product engineers, and there are sales engineers, and that if I were an R&D engineer, I would get so bored sitting in what I imagined in my head at the time as like a small closet programming on a computer or working on electrical components. And, and not really getting out and interacting with our customers or, or and other individuals outside of the R&D team. And that's where I found out that, hey, you know, maybe R&D isn't the best fit for me. I need to go more into uh, what we call here at Stratasys an, an applications engineer uh, position or a solutions engineering position, as I call it. Uh, what, what that really is, is, uh, you know, I spent about two years in tech support, uh, and then I moved over to an applications engineering role where I started working directly with the healthcare community on how do we actually use 3D printing equipment to manufacture goods. Um, so that's when we go out to medical device manufacturers like Medtronic, uh, Zimmer Biomet, Stryker is, a, I know, a big supporter of FIRST, mm -hmm. uh, and, and helping them say, hey, if we're putting a Stratasys J750 or if we're putting a HP MJS technology or if we're putting a 3D systems stereolithography system to use, how do we make sure we're using it for the right applications and the right reasons? Uh, and that's a, a whole slew of information. I, I usually spend uh, one to two days with our customers on site, just working with their engineers, going through the technology they have looking at what they're designing, what they're manufacturing, what they're prototyping today and saying, hey, 
instead of using this conventional method of building 40 aluminum parts to create tooling for this manufacturing process, why don't we just print one plastic part that does everything you want it to do, reduces your cost tenfold, and makes it a hell of a lot easier. So, so that's, that's, that's kind of where I am today. Um, and I, I, you guys, I'm sure heard me mention that I never graduated from Dunwoody. I do not have a degree at, at this point in time, but I actually, I'm currently attending online classes at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, and I'm going for my business degree. So uh, my entire life up until probably two years ago, I thought I always wanted to be an engineer. Um, but now I, I really think that I want to go down that more business route. Um, I like to think that, you know, I've, I've spent my time <laughs> programming. I've spent my time. So software engineer, uh, I spent my time being an electrical engineer and I spent my time being an electrical or a mechanical engineer. Uh, and now I'm really ready to move on kind of more of the business role, the business side of things. So, one of the things that I heard when you were talking is that it sounds like you're assessing people's manufacturing and production lines and you are identifying ways to like simplify their processes. Um, is, so like in one sentence, like what is it that you do? Like really condense one <laughs> sentence, like what you put on your resume, like what what is that? I get asked that question a lot and it's really a difficult question to answer. Yeah. Um, my my response to it is I solve problems. Uh, I solve additive manufacturing problems. I solve manufacturing problems, however you want to phrase that. That's why, you know, internally at Stratasys, I'm called a healthcare applications engineer. But what does applications mean to the, the common individual in the industry? It can mean a variety of things. That's why I call myself now a, a healthcare solutions engineer, because I'm going out to my customers. I'm going out to, to individuals that want to incorporate 3D printing and additive manufacturing, and I'm helping them solve their problems. So I'm, I'm creating solutions, generating solutions for them. Well, and I think that's the thing is that it's almost like right now with all of your technical skills that you have, um, adding the business portion onto it will just enable you to gain more of the people oriented, business oriented skills to kind of um, build your different pieces. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like it, even with this uh, COVID-19 uh, projects that have started coming up. Uh, one absolutely incredible thing I've learned in the, <laughs> I would actually say, I, I don't, is today Thursday? I think today is Thursday. Let me look at my calendar. It is. That's Thursday. In the, in the past week, a week ago today at noon, I was told that, hey, we need a face shield. Seven days ago. And, I, and it just brought me back to my whole first experience back when we had the build season in six weeks, of course, um, of I have this impossible challenge. A, we need to design a face shield. B, we need to you know, procure uh, the shield portion of the visor. C, we need to identify a manufacturing plan and process these files to be manufactured on our equipment uh, in, a, in a diversified manner. You know, It's not only gonna be Stratasys that's manufacturing these. We have so many different partners contacting us and reaching out. And, and when we do have those manufactured by our partners, how do they go into a, a common location, a logistics location, and then be shipped out to the hospital partners that we also have that are saying, I need over 100,000 visors in the next seven days. So seven days ago, we knew that there was a need. And, and today we really know, we've kind of defined what that need is. We've kind of defined a process to go through it. And we've really begun that manufacturing. We think that just with our own internal capacity, we're going to be manufacturing around 2,500 visors a day. And we think that once we include our, our partner uh, network in that, and I'm, I'm not making any commitments here, of course, but uh, we'll be close to uh, probably about 30,000 visors a day, which is just an astronomical number, especially looking at seven days ago where we were. Absolutely. So going backwards, looking at a higher level, the uh, 3D printing kind of world as you see it now, um, how has the 3D printing industry shaken up manufacturing, traditional manufacturing? Yeah, yep. Uh, there are so many different ways that it's, it's started to shake up traditional manufacturing and that it's been shaking up traditional manufacturing for years. Um, of course, we've heard a lot about this in the past as uh, uh, the buzzword has been always been 3D printing or rapid prototyping. Uh, the new buzzword is additive manufacturing. Uh, so in the past, it's been a lot of prototyping. You know, how do I, I design this 
uh, I always like to use a catheter handle as an example. Uh, how do I design this catheter handle handle to be ergonomic? Uh, from a prototype aspect, it's really difficult to manufacture one, hand that to a doctor or a surgeon and say, how does this feel? And then to tell you, it feels terrible. I don't know what button to press. I could harm the patient because I don't know what button to press and give us a whole slew of reasons not to use it. But with 3D printing from a prototype aspect, you can really go in there and say, let me design and then print off 50 different catheter handles. Give all of those to the surgeon or the doctor and, and have them tell me which five fit best and then refine those five designs. And we've really started to see the same thing in manufacturing that, you know, additive manufacturing isn't necessarily better at a conventional manufacturing in any sense. It's just more customizable. So my favorite example from a manufacturing standpoint is, is clear aligners. Everybody's probably heard of Invisalign. There's now Smile Direct Club. There's Clear Correct. There's all these different Invisaligner technologies out there. Uh, what they are are just small pieces of plastic that you put in your mouth and it helps you align your teeth. Uh, the manufacturing process for these actually really incorporates a lot of 3D printing. You're going to go to your dentist. You're going to go to a Smile Direct Club uh, uh, location. You're going to have uh, an impression taken of your teeth, whether it's a scan uh, via uh, an x-ray or if it's going to be an impression or they're actually physically putting something in your mouth and you're biting down. What happens is those get sent out to a manufacturing facility, one of those big manufacturers I mentioned, pre mentioned previously, they take that 3D model, whether they're scanning it in or taking the scan data from the dentist directly, and then they're applying their own software algorithms to create a treatment plan. Uh, once that treatment plan has been defined and it's all in these little 3D printed arches, they're going to print all of those out. And there's multiple technologies that are used for that today, whether it be polyjet or stair lithography from the 3D printing world. Once they're printed out, they have little thermal form pieces of plastic uh, formed over them, which is a process that essentially you take your, usually have some arches that are sitting around here. See if I can uh, grab sure. them here. So you take an arch that looks like this. So here's just some teeth. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, you form a very thin sheet of plastic, exactly like what we're using here for our face visors, a little bit thinner to be honest. Um, and then you trim out what's left. Um, which gives you just your, your very clear uh, aligner that you use for your teeth. So it's a manufacturing process where additive manufacturing plays a key role, and it has to play a key role because how else are you going to do it? Are you really going to go in and CNC mill out each and every single mold when you need to do over 100,000 per day? Probably not really a good way of doing it. So that's, that's where additive manufacturing plays a key role, and I think we're going to increasingly see that with our devices. Uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson last year released a, uh, an app where you can scan your face with a special camera, and then it will actually give you a, a customized face mask for moisturizing your face uh, that's, that's built to how your face looks, which is just an amazing uh, way of doing things. Um, I know in, in the Asian market, there's a project going on with actually the Stratasys J750, where they uh, are, are essentially manufacturing, let's see if I have another object here. So with the Stratasys J750, we can print in full color. Um, this is just one example. It only has blue cyan and black, or sorry, wow. uh, blue slash cyan and, and yellow in order to create the green color and then black for the background. And we can do full color prints. So in the Asian market, they've actually started customizing Mini Coopers. You can have, uh, you can put whatever logo you want oh. on just a small portion of your Mini Cooper. And again, you can put whatever you want there. You can customize your car. As the technology matures, we're going to see more and more of that. I mean, imagine instead of going in and, and buying a, this is a high level example, buying a car that's made for mass manufacturing, everybody gets the same thing. Instead of going in and on the website saying, I want this part like this, this part like that, it needs to be sized specifically for how tall I am or how much I weigh. And then, uh, and then they'll manufacture it without any change in their manufacturing process, which is uh, just if you think of the applications there, they're, they're more than I could count. So technology is not quite there yet today, but it's going in that direction. Sure. So do you have to become an expert in a variety of areas in order to help people problem solve? Or is there a problem solving process you're able to kind of consistently apply in order to understand the issues they're facing and then problem solve them, like add, add another mind, a different perspective to that process with what you know with 3D printing? That is a very difficult question, but a very good one at that. Um, 
So I'd say from a problem solving standpoint, um, there isn't really a single process I can use or that I've developed uh, just because the companies I work with are so there, there's such a wide variety of products. There's such a wide variety of, of processes that could support them that I can't really just say, this is the process I use to go in and problem solve. I, I would say that, you know, kind of my experiences as a first student uh, really taught me a lot about how do I uh, approach a problem. And how do I really understand and define what that problem is as I go in? And then from there, once that problem is defined, I can pretty much take one of many paths, uh, depending on, on how I've defined it. Do you typically look at the possibilities that are available or do you look at like kind of the hard factual data? Have you ever done the Myers-Briggs test? Like I'm kind of interested to know if like that mindset is kind of like brought into this at all or if it's just something not, not at all. I don't know. So I've, I've used a combination of both. It really depends on the, the company I've been working with and, and the product we're looking at. If there are hardcore numbers that we can attribute to it, or if this is something brand new that nobody's ever done before, then we kind of got to develop that process and really understand um, how the more factual engineering sides can play into it. You know, if I say, hey, like today, hey, I want to manufacture a ventilator. Um, and I need this, this respirator bag that opens and closes in very soft material. Um, what soft materials can I 3D print to do that? And it would be me um, probably sitting there going, no, you should never do this. Please don't do this. Don't ask me these questions. There's so many variables involved in this and, and we can't accurately do this with 3D printing today. But also there's, you know, the curious part of me is if we were to prototype this in a, in a stereolithography or bat photopolymerization technology with a soft material, what's going to happen? If we were to prototype this in, in our polyjet, what's going to happen if we were going to print this on a TPU material? on a fused deposition modeling or fused filament fabrication printer, and we were to seal it using some either sort of a dissolving process or a glue process on the exterior, what's going to happen? Um, unfortunately, there are just so many variables and so many questions for a project like that, that um, in most cases, the investment in doing the research and development is so much greater than just building tooling for the application that exists today that it's going to be way easier to go in and, and conventionally manufacture something like that. Sure. So looking at the F, the first community, um, can you talk a little bit about how um, you slash Stratasys has maybe engaged with some of the FTC teams? I feel like I consistently run into you and a FTC team that has, you know, a significantly large number of 3D printed parts in their robot um, in Detroit on an annual basis, maybe every year. Um, or at least the past two years. Uh, and so how has that engagement looked? And then, uh, you know, from an FTC side, there's a lot of 3D printing. Do you see FRC teams taking advantage of that yet? Or is that kind of a more recent development? Talk, kind of talk about that aspect of it. Yeah, so uh, what you actually see behind me here over my uh, uh, right shoulder is uh, 5943. They were a First Tech Challenge team a few years back. Uh, they decided to 3D print. So, uh, their entire robot their senior year. And they did compete in Indiana. Uh, I believe this robot was actually at the Indiana State Championships for First Tech Challenge a few years ago. Uh, just to show off what we could do with 3D printing, what the actual potential is behind it. And I, I really think that the technology is a perfect fit for First Tech Challenge sized robots. Um, using a lot of what we're going to uh, see and, and kind of the maker level printer. So if you buy an Ulti maker or if you buy a Prusa or any of those kind of third party Chinese vendors uh, from Amazon or eBay as well, you're going to actually be able to manufacture a lot of your parts for a first tech challenge robot. But if we start looking at the first robotics competition and, and the stresses involved with your printers or with your robots there, you're going to start running into a lot of issues if you're using basic materials like PLA, ABS, um, ASA. Uh, you're going to want a little bit stronger materials, which you can typically find within your Mark Forge printers and their Onyx materials, or with uh, something that you'd find in a more industrial printer from Stratasys or 3D Systems or HP. Unfortunately, you also see a lot of cost inflation uh, when, you, when you get to these larger technologies as well. So I actually took a few years break from uh, mentoring and coaching first teams just to concentrate on my uh, career. So about two, maybe three years ago, I was a, I was a senior mentor. Um, and I, I like to say I graduated from a senior mentor program and, and went to, to work full time for Stratasys. Um, so instead of, you know, splitting my time uh, 40 hours a week with Stratasys and 40 hours a week for, for uh, first, I went to 80 hours a week for Stratasys. 
And uh, as I built that career, I kind of got into a point now where I'm like, hey, I'm pretty comfortable where I am. Um, I know what I'm doing. I can continue to build my, my skills at work. Let's go back and mentor a first team. Um, so that was this year. I didn't pick the perfect season to come back, but uh, yeah. I was really excited to come back. So uh, I'm still hopeful that my team gets to compete. Unfortunately, they were one of the teams that did not make it to an event yet this season. Uh, but their robot is, uh, the majority of it is 3D printed. Uh, so we're actually using on our uh, flywheel to launch the, geez, it's been such a long week. I don't even remember the name of the uh, power, power cells. Is that the yellow balls this year, power cells? I, I think so. You put me on the spot there. Uh, anyway, the game piece <laughs> from this season. The game piece. Um, yeah, so we're yes. actually, uh, we 3D printed a flywheel out of our Polyjet technology. So it's like a, it's a, it's a resin, it's an acrylic based flywheel. And we incorporated two materials in it, 3D printing at one time. We have a rigid core, a rigid interior to provide structure to it. And then we have a very thin exterior on the outside of it. That's a rubber like material to really add that increased friction that we wanted to see on our flywheel. But on the back of it, we have a 3D printed Delrin like material as kind of our backing that, as our hood that can go up and down and, and change our angle to decrease the amount of friction we see there so that we get the trajectory we want. And I thought that was an absolutely awesome way of uh, utilizing 3D printing on a first robotics competition robot. And I would have loved to see it compete. I know we did a lot of testing, a lot of prototyping uh, on that and it worked really well, uh, especially at our week zero event. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's 3D printing all over the robot um, I'm trying to remember. It's, it's been a couple of weeks since I've been with the team now because our, our schools are closed. Right. But I'm trying to remember all the places we put in 3D printed parts. Oh, um, so our, our intake is uh, just like a lot of teams out there this year. All of our intake is, is 3D printed, or at least the mechanism wheels uh, sitting on a, a hex, uh, a half inch hex shaft. And then uh, going in from the intake, once we actually get into the robot, our entire conveyor system has pulleys that are all 3D printed uh, to be incredibly light, but still strong enough to uh, be able to convey that ball all the way up to our uh, shooting mechanism. Do any of your students um, or you working with your students, would it be possible to kind of create like a resource or documentation um, about those different pieces or even uh, come back maybe for one of our like team tip pieces to talk about how 3D printing is applied to the robot? Um, because it just sounds super interesting, um, and and I think that would be cool. But going back to another question, I think we're going to be wrapping up here. Uh, we're going to go a little bit longer uh, and then wrap up in, a, I'd say, about five to seven minutes. Um, but one of the questions I had for you, just kind of personally, um, the way I phrase this is kind of like when I look at myself, you know, one of the things I really love doing and I kind of like nerd, quote unquote, nerd out about slash get really passionate about um, is nonprofit management. Um, mm -hmm. In addition to breaking down arguments uh, and being able to like do kind of this creative writing piece uh, in order to formulate a step by step argument for these people. And so my degree in rhetoric kind of helped apply to those pieces. And then my master's in nonprofit management are why I kind of look at those different areas. And so those are the things that I get really passionate about from your perspective. Like what could you talk about, you know, all day and not get bored? Yeah. Um, one thing I just absolutely love to talk about is the, the impact that additive manufacturing 3d printing can, can have on the healthcare community. Um, if we look at, you know, uh, a surgeon today, somebody who's going in and performing a surgery, whether it's for oncology, which is cancer, essentially cancer treatment, if it's for uh, cardiovascular, like your heart and your, your vessel uh, leading up to your heart, uh, a surgeon today doesn't really have the right tools to practice that surgery before they actually go in and perform it on a human for the real, for the first time. You know, they might be practicing on, on pig cadavers, uh, for example, or they might be practicing on some synthetic models. Well, one thing that we've been working on really hard over the last couple of years at Stratus is, is building what we call the, the digital anatomy solution. So that means we can actually take a, a neurovascular model like I have right here. I know it's kind of hard to see because it's all white and transparent, uh, but these are, this is typically is your blood flexing? would flow through these. Yes, it's Ooh. flexible. So it's a vessel material that's flexible. Uh, the goal behind this is uh, what we can actually do is we can flow blood-like material through here, uh, put it at pulsatile flow. So it actually pulses like, a, like your real cardiovascular or vascular system would. And then we can uh, do... Uh, real extractions of thrombuses or blood clots 
uh, from the actual model and practices on something that actually feels like a real human at the right temperature and at the right uh, pulse and tile flow. Um, another thing that <laughs> I like to uh, always bring up is the gummy bear. Um, this is 3D printed. So we're using a combination of different materials in here. Uh, Nifty. Says, do not eat, do not eat exactly. me. <laughs> Don't eat this. It's not good to eat. Um, but it, you really want to eat it when you're touching it because it feels like a real gummy bear. But you can actually, so there's a little heart in the gummy bear that you can actually surgically remove uh, oh, wow. just as an example of what you can do. Um, another thing, uh, if you guys are familiar with sutures or stitches, uh, can be another way of, of saying it. This is, suture pads are very common. So we've developed some suture pads that you can actually go in and uh, stitch together various lines on these. Uh, this isn't a very good example to actually practice on, but it's uh, just a small example I happen to have here at the office today. Um, another thing we're working on is I don't have any bone models here. I do have a tumor model. Uh, mm. But essentially, this is supposed to be a bone model. It was a very mm -hmm. early rendition of something I'm doing for a workshop on how do we actually print with bone models and, and what is it uh, like on the interior. Uh, but this was supposed to be a wishbone. Unfortunately, it's just too hard to break. I can't break it. Um, but uh, if we actually were to cut into this, uh, it would react like a real bone if you were cutting into it. So you would actually be able to see the different layers. As we go from the inside to the outside of the bone, you're going to have uh, you know, bone marrow. You're going to have your cortical structure on the inside. You're going to have a soft, spongy interior trabecular structure if we're talking like a femur bone. Um, so as we cut into this, we'd actually be able to see that. And the way we're generating that is pretty advanced. Uh, everybody on this call or everybody listening in hopefully has, has heard of Minecraft in some way before, you know, that block game where you, you sure. assemble things. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty popular in the first community from what I've heard, but um, we're using the same technology to print this. We're using Minecraft to print this essentially. It's called voxel technology. Uh, we're building blocks in order to create this. We take a very simple file, so if we were to actually design this in CAD, it would be just completely hollow on the interior, right? If we were to 3D print it on a commonly available maker system today, um, it would be all one material. Well, with our technology, what we can go in and do is we can actually define voxel by voxel what's on the inside of this using algorithmic generation. So we're using, uh, in this model, we're using a gyroid algorithm, we're using uh, a Perlin noise algorithm to generate that trabecular structure, to generate the bone marrow so that it feels real. So we have soft material, we have rigid material, we have semi-soft material all throughout this model in order to actually accurately print that. You can see that a little bit better here. This is a, a demo tumor model. I don't know, oh, look at that idea. So I'll just do a quick example. Uh, I'm gonna pull out a Sure. Scalpel. <laughs> um, that's actually sterilized and disposable. And you can see I, I actually have a very sharp knife here, and I have a, a tumor that was printed, again, a very simple object. And what I can do is cut into it. Kind of hard to see in, in this orientation, I understand. Um, and again, it's all white material, but as I peel back the skin layer, so this is a tumor that you'd say, for example, find in a kidney, you can see sure. there's an incredibly advanced uh, structure on the interior. A little it's, too uh, fuzzy. You'll uh, have to take Perlin. photos. But yeah. I'll have to take photos, but it's a pearl and noise um, generation of our, our rigid structure and our very soft structure. So it actually feels like a real tumor. And we've validated some studies with the University of Minnesota where they actually are removing these from fake kidneys. Excellent. All right. So that got very deep. I appreciate it. Uh, really quick. Um, what is one speaker or like uh, motivational speaker or book or quote that you live by that you really enjoy and like? Uh, my favorite speech ever given. I uh, wasn't alive for it, but John F. Kennedy and the reason we go to the moon. Awesome. That is by far my favorite speech in, that I've ever heard. So. Okay, so we'll have to pull in a link to that uh, once we pull the video so that our students can take a look at that. Um, and then last question i need you to be short because we're going to transition into our next speaker um is what is the what is the one possibility that you're excited in terms of the future for 3d printing that you can actually talk about <laughs> i can actually talk about uh well i would say if you look up some of the new emerging startups and technologies out there i'll just list a couple of them out um, evolve additive manufacturing has a really cool technology where they can uh, compete directly with injection molding through 3D printing. Um, Czar 3D has a really cool powder bed fusion process um, that is going to be perfect for manufacturing models. And then 
I can't talk about any of the other ones, but I can point you towards a really cool video. If you look up um, Stratasys uh, Robotics Composite Demonstrator on YouTube, I think it's Stratasys Robotic Composite Demonstrator. It's uh, a gigantic robot arm on a rotating tray that's actually printing varying structures. Uh, and, and some of the demonstrators we have on YouTube associated with that video could literally print a whole boat or a whole car. Um, it's cool to see technology like that that could potentially be impacting us in the future. Awesome. That sounds great. Um, I am throwing you a link. You'll have to let me know in the chat if that's the one that we'll do. But I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Um, this was, you know, really fascinating to talk with you about. Um, and should our students or teams have any other questions, um, you know, maybe we can talk about bringing you on board another time or even just, again, doing your team tip um, to talk about how you use 3D printing uh, to solve problems with an FRC team. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, and at this point, we're going to be transitioning into our how do you build a team structure to ensure that every student has a meaningful experience with uh, Rachel. So Evan, thank you for your time. Thanks, Renee. Awesome. All right. Hi, Rachel. How are you doing today? Hi, Renee. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, all things good. considered. <laughs> yep, I, you know, I completely understand. Um, so I really appreciate your time. I know that we have Sam here from our student board of directors, um, mm -hmm. who's kind of come on board. Um, and I believe Chris can give us, uh, can give you co-hosting capabilities. Um, but I'm certainly looking forward to talking about, you know, this topic in terms of the various um, structures that teams have and how you can make sure that every student is engaged. I think that that's just kind of a beautiful way to to look at this topic. So thank you so much. Definitely no problem. And like the main thing I want to focus on when talking about this is um, when creating your team structure or your culture, um, the fact is you want to create an environment that is meaningful for everyone involved. Um, so that's really something I want to hit on and really focus on throughout this presentation. So. Okay, hey, so real quick, um, my background, uh, I am 15 years in first. I'm an FLL and FRC alumni um, from uh, FRC team 1741 and then the FLL teams through Center Grove as well. Um, still live in Greenwood, Indiana. I moved back here after college. Um, I am the former lead mentor for FRC team 5188. It's a team I helped found while I was in college at Indiana State University. And then I'm also the former first senior mentor for Central Indiana, and I transitioned out of that role um, at the end of last year. Um, over the years, I volunteered at all levels of FIRST, um, so I have different experiences for different programs. And then I also have um, transitioned into the head operations mentor for FRC 1741. So I'm back with them, back with my alumni team. Um, and like I said, I'm back in Greenwood. So um, I want to hit a few things before we get started. First is um, there's no right or wrong way to structure a team. I used to get the question a lot when I was a senior mentor or when this topic comes up is like, what's the right way to do it? What's the wrong way to do it? How, how do you do it? Can I copy you? Of course, you can copy exactly what my team does right now, but that might not work for your team. There is no right or wrong way. The big thing you need to do is figure out what works for your team and that may take some time and that may take some trial and error. Um, it didn't happen overnight um, that the teams that I've worked with in the past or the big successful teams out there that you've seen, they've created a culture that um, is meaningful for everyone that didn't happen overnight. Um, and it's something that they constantly work on. So that is something to keep in mind um, through your first journey. Um, like I mentioned, the important thing is to engage everyone and the way you do that is the way you do that. There's no right or wrong. Um, a lot of times teams struggle at first because they don't realize that your team needs to operate like a business. Um, really, we are like a business, so you kind of need to have that mindset. Now, I'm not saying you need to have like CEO, chief financial officer, and all these different th roles like that. Not necessarily like that, but there are many different pieces. Just like a business, a business has many, many different pieces that make it a successful business. Teams have that as well. Um, I already kind of hit find what works for your team. Again, that may take trial and error, but that's okay. And it may change over time. Um, so a rookie team, 
or even some of those younger teams, maybe two, three-year-old teams, I can guarantee when they get up to five, 10, 15 years, uh, Red Alert's actually celebrating its 15th year anniversary this year. We do not look the same um, as we did back when we started. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Now, with all of that being said, um, and I kind of hit on this, it's about dividing and conquering. You can't put everything, um, just like if you think of a business, not everything is on the CEO. Yes, it kind of comes back to that, but it is not just on one person. Dividing and conquering, I think, is key to be a successful first team at any level. Um, so when people are like, okay, I'm ready, how do I create my team culture or how do I structure my team? Um, you start out with some basics. The first question you're gonna to wanna to ask is what does your team want to focus on? Um, and from there, you can kind of go from what does your team stand for? Um, what is important to your team? Analyzing those things, uh, who makes up your team? So I know Renee um, and the student board of directors hit on earlier how like you have those different personality types and different things like that. Examining that is actually really, really helpful um, to help determine what is gonna be the best fit and the best structure for your team. Um, and then kind of once you understand what makes up your team and what is important to your team, setting those goals helps you determine uh, where you can go next. Um, the next big question you're going to want to ask your team is what resources do we have? Um, and you don't have to get super specific with your resources. You can just think, okay, what are our school resources? What schools are we pulling from? Are we based in a school? Are we more of a community team pulling from several schools? Whatever works, just kind of looking at that. Um, mentors, what kind of resources do you have to mentors? Do you already have a lot of mentors? Do you need to get some more mentors? What are some companies you could reach out to for mentors and different things like that? Um, and then the next thing would be looking at your student base. Um, how big is your school? Uh, can you pull from a lot of different people? Uh, different groups of students, because I know sometimes people struggle, oh, we come from a really, really small school and I don't know how to recruit students. Well, look at what your student base is. Yes, it must be smaller and that's okay, but what kind of students are you pulling from? Do you guys have a really good um, STEM program? Do you have classes like Project Lead the Way? Or do you have business classes and different things like that? And see if you can kind of pull and get an idea of what your student base is. And then looking at your sponsors as well. Um, a lot of times people don't really think of the sponsors as part of your team structure or your team culture, but they are. Um, they are part of that. And I stress that to teams all the time because you want to keep in mind what um, you want your sponsors, what your sponsors are expecting to get out of this. So you want them to be a part of that culture. Um, and then from there, teams typically break out into two sides. Um, some teams don't like that there kind of tends to be two sides. And again, that's fine. There's no right or wrong way, but there typically tends to be two sides. One is the engineering side or the robot, robot side. And then I call it the operations side. I call it operations because I do not like the term non-engineering or used to be called PR or public relations. I do not like that term um, because really there is a type of engineering into that side. Um, it just might not be your typical engineering like it is when it comes to robots. Give me just one second. Okay, let me check if we have any questions real quick. I did. Um, I did throw in a quick question, um, okay. which was, how do you know? Like one of the things you talked about was like it's all right to adjust and change and you know modify structures. And I just was wondering, um, do you does that happen naturally? Are there certain things you should be looking for to know when it's time to make that switch? Yeah, it does kind of happen naturally, but also uh, I make sure with whatever teams I work with that it's really important that you take time to analyze how your season is going. Um, so doing those like, um, I tend to encourage pest and SWOT analysis, uh, specifically SWOT, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, that's a good basic 
thing to help you analyze how your season is going. And then from there, you can kind of say, okay, we're not working great on this side of the team. Do we need to restructure or do we need to just maybe do some more training or different things like that? Um, so I definitely think it kind of happens naturally, but it only happens naturally if you take time to analyze how your season is going. Awesome. Fantastic. No problem. Okay. Um, so the next few sides are just some helpful tips and I will share what are some uh, structures that I've worked with with teams in the past, but before I wanted to get to that I wanted to show some um, helpful tips that I think no matter what your team structure is, these are good to keep in mind. Um, the first one is clear expectations, um, specifically with the teams that I've always worked with I suggest having a team handbook. Um, I've put a link in the slide and I'm sure once we get this posted, uh, we can put a link out there um, to the Red Alert 1741 um, handbook. I know a lot of teams have looked at our handbook in the past and copied it. Perfectly fine. I don't care. Um, take a look at it. We have developed that over years. Um, so feel free to take a look at it. Um, but that really outlines our expectations for our students. And then we make sure to go over those expectations several times throughout mainly the off season, not really during build season, but um, we definitely want to have those expectations outlined um, and make sure that the students are understanding them throughout the season. Um, and then that also helps you when an issue does arise. Um, you don't wanna place blame on anything. You can kind of refer back to the handbook and say, okay, these were the expectations that were outlined. Why did they not work out? Um, and pulling up the expectations has been really, really helpful. Um, I hit this on a slide earlier, um, focusing on what your team wants to do. I think it's really important and something we focus on on Red Alert is we do what our students want to do. So if our students come to us and say like, hey, we've been doing this for a while, but we don't feel super passionate about it anymore. We open up a discussion of like, okay, why do we not feel passionate about it? Can we modify it? Do we need to move on? What can be a new project? Different things like that. Um, sometimes we need convincing to go in the right direction. Um, that's not to say that if a team, if students or who, whoever on your team says, we don't wanna do this anymore, we're not gonna do that. That's not to say to completely scrap it. Um, you just need to sit down and analyze, is this benefiting our team? What can we do? What can we modify to move forward? Um, communication is key to having a successful and meaningful uh, culture for everyone involved on your team. Um, Chris hit on some communication tips earlier on what we can do kind of during these trying times. Um, but mentor meetings are, I think, super important. Um, for the teams that I've worked on uh, during the off season, we meet at least once a month. And then during the actual season, we're meeting um, just once a week. And it's just a little bit earlier than when the students arrive um, and just saying, okay, everyone good to go. Everyone understand what the next week is gonna look like. Okay, we're good to go. And we can move forward and help kind of guide the students through the meeting. Um, also leadership meetings. So that be with your mentors and your student leadership. Um, those are super important. We have those weekly year round. Again, it's just a few minutes before our actual team meeting starts. Um, so it's nothing too crazy um, and nothing super extra that we have to add into our meeting schedule. Um, emails are super important. Remind um, is a texting application that we use um, and Slack and Discord, which again, Chris hit on all that earlier. So I'm not gonna go super deep into that. Um, mentors need roles too. I'm not saying every single mentor needs a title. Um, however, making sure you're understand, under, making sure your mentors understand what is expected of them and how your team culture is functioning. And again, that kind of goes back to the mentor meetings, establishing that in your mentor meetings um, is very important. And I'll talk about how the mentors work on 1741 here in a little bit. So you kind of get an idea of just how we do it. Um, parents, I say involve your parents as much as you can. Specifically, I enjoy parent organizations kind of had, and that's not saying parents can't be mentors, or if you don't want a parent organization and combine them with your mentors, that's fine too, but they're super helpful. 
um, <clears throat> it takes some stress off the mentors that specifically how we do it on 1741, it takes a lot of stress off the mentors. Um, and it's again, going back to the fact of dividing and conquering. Um, encourage your parents to get involved encourage your parents that they do not have to be an engineer they do not have to be stem smart or anything they don't have to know anything about robotics but if they can come in and bring cookies to a meeting just to cheer everyone up like that's a great thing to do um if they can help with travel and different things like that that's all super helpful and i'm i know on every single team there are parents out there wanting to help so please reach out to them and see how you can get them involved. Um, and then something new I've kind of implemented over the past few years and encouraged teams to do is um, leadership training. Now, Renee kind of went over um, analyzing personalities and different things like that. And I think that's part of leadership training and I'll go over that, um, why that's important here in a little bit, but um, it's a good way to kind of lay it all out. Um, you can go over those expectations like I talked to. You can at least start developing some goals with your leadership and then go to the entire team and like examine those goals or add to those goals and different things like that. Um, leadership training will look different for every single team, but I think it's important that you keep that in mind and it doesn't have to be an all day thing. It doesn't have to be a big elaborate thing, um, but it's something that I think is helpful. And if you can get um, a professional involved, we actually had um, one of our parents happens to be involved in a nonprofit and is involved in a lot of leadership roles in our community. She actually came in and gave a talk on what it means to be a leader. So that was actually super helpful and it gave the students a break from seeing the mentors the entire time. They got to see the parents and kind of how their leadership role works in their community. Check for questions real quick. Looks like we're good for now. Okay. Um, captains, leads, whatever you want to call your leadership are not the only leaders on your team. Um, and I talked about having that leadership training. I think that's important to have that for whatever you have um, on your team, whether it be called captains or leads. But um, having that general training for all of your students is super important. Um, and discussing what it means to be a leader, um, helping them understand what it means to be a leader versus a boss, understanding how to work with those different personalities. Um, and the big, big thing that I think a lot of um, students who want to be in a leadership role or even sometimes mentors struggle um, to click at first is you do not have to be the best at everything to be a leader. Um, it just, again, it goes back to understanding what it's like to work with those different personalities, leader versus boss, but you do not have to be the best at everything to be a good leader. Um, I think something that one of my students came up with a few years ago that I really love and I've kind of taken to heart is you want to leave a legacy as a leader. Um, and again, a leader is not a leader or a captain on the team, but the goal should be to leave a legacy. Um, so that's really, really important for everyone on your team to keep in mind. Um, encouraging working together, we kind of already kind of hit on that, but um, not placing blame. So for example, if like um, the shooting sub team is behind, sometimes it's, oh, well, it's mechanical's fault because they haven't gotten all the parts done. Oh, it's programming's fault because they haven't gotten the programming done. It's like, nope, stop, let's analyze the situation um, and figure out what are the best ways we can go moving forward. Um, so encouraging that working together and sometimes that means mentors stepping in um, and helping them kind of be that transition into how can we uh, fix this and how can we prevent this moving forward. I believe that students should be involved in every aspect of the team. Um, yes, actually we have one quick question we'll go ahead and do real quick before I go on a tangent of why everyone should be involved in everything on the team. Thanks so Sam, Rachel. No problem. Hi, so I'm Sam from 3176. I was in the SBOD discussion earlier 
But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about all the different kinds of leaders and how they intermingle with mentors and stuff like that. Um, a lot of what our team does going into build season is we have every day and after meeting um, consensus of what's gotten done and how our different leaders on the team have all been working together to get to our common goal, obviously, of either building a robot or um, our non-technical sub teams there, um, their outreach or our um, business team there, what they've been working on. So our leadership structure, um, which I'll talk about a little more later probably is um, a function where we have a student advisory board or our SAB, and then we have experts, which are people that show um, proficiency in a certain field. And those are meetings where everybody from that leadership comes together along with our mentors. So we can talk about who needs the most support and from what different resources and what different areas. And um, that was something we really grew and started this year. And over the course of build season, those meetings became really effective because it made ordering parts a lot easier. It made getting tasks done between sub teams a lot easier and that coordination. So it's, it is very, very important to make sure that your leadership, even if it's not your like main leadership is all together cohesively so that the common plan is coming together. Definitely. Right. And just to kind of like piggyback off that, we actually kind of have like two separate leadership meetings. Um, each week we have one for our higher captains, almost like that board you were talking about. And then we have one that includes like all of the leaders. So that includes more of like the sub teams. Um, and though I think having those two separate ones, so the captains can discuss, okay, Hey, this sub teams kind of seems a behind let's pick up the slack there. And then maybe a few days later at the big leadership meeting, they can say, okay, we're back on track. We're good to go. So I think that's definitely helpful. Um, so back to the third bullet point that students should be involved in just more than one aspect of the team. Um, I think that it's important for students to explore all aspects that, um, you can find within first. Um, I'll kind of use myself as a personal example. When I came into this, when I was a first Lego league student, um, I was a programmer. I love programming. So when I got into FRC, I'm like, yes, I want to program, got into programming. And it's like, no, I don't want to program. This is not what I thought it was going to be at all. But by that time, and the old structure that we used to have was, nope, I was a programmer the rest of the season. And that's what I was going to do. Um, so now we encourage a more fluid type of, yes, we do have those leaders and those captains who are over those sub teams. And yes, you do tend to have students who tend to specialize in a being a programmer, or um, we have students who specialize in doing machining and different things like that, and that's fine, but we encourage all our students to do um, all different aspects of the teams. And one way we do encourage this is our varsity letter program. Um, sometimes students need encouragement, and in order for our teams to, our students to get a varsity letter, they have to be involved in many different aspects of the team. Um, so, one of the ways is through outreach hours, one of the ways is through training, one of the ways is through actual build season hours, one way is through um, attending competitions. So all those different things add up into a student being involved in many different aspects of the team. And that way they can explore many different aspects. Um, Evan, who was just on here, talked about how he always thought he was gonna be an engineer and then he got into engineering and was like, actually no um so hopefully by involving students in a lot of different sides of your team you can kind of help with that um and explore many different things through first um and then the last bullet point that i'm going to hit here before i kind of go into some specific red alert and 5188 stuff is that if your team is functioning at its best um everyone has a role. That doesn't mean that their role is captain or leader, but everyone has kind of found their niche um, and figured out how they can work and help out the team to be the best that it can be. So I mentioned how um, having those kind of leadership talks and leadership training with everyone on your team um, throughout the year is super important. And one way we do that on Red Alert is we pull up and talk about um, three questions pretty often throughout the year. Um, not every single week, not every single month. Any, uh, but we, when a student joins our team, we give them a business card and we tell them, please keep this business card on your person at all times. Um, and that business card serves as a reminder of what their expectations are and what expectations should be for people they're interacting with.
Um, so the first question we always encourage them is, can I trust you? Um, the second one is, are you committed to excellence? And then do you care about me? Um, those are three questions we kind of use as a guiding model to set our expectations with our students, whether they be a leader or a not, or not in a leadership role. Um, but I think it's super important to have that reminder and um, bring it up often with your kids. Passion, leadership, and community is just something else that we have on the card. And again, just reminders for them to understand what we want our team culture to be about. Now, okay, so this is the actual structure for 5188. Um, and this is what from 2014 to 2016. So when I was the lead mentor, I think it's pretty similar now. Um, but I think this is a good kind of basic structure if you want to look at it from an organizational chart standpoint. Um, again, going back to if your team is um, really being a success and creating that um, engaging culture for everyone, this should not matter. Um, it shouldn't ma matter exactly which role you're in, but it should be a guiding um, force to how you function. So Rose Holman and uh, the Vigo County School Corporation were kind of the top uh, for us. And then we had our mentors, which we at that time, we were pretty much all college mentors. Um, and then from there, we had one executive team captain who she, uh, she, cause it was a girl when I was back on the team. Um, she was leading the meetings and she would like kind of announce those things. And she would be that floating person to just kind of make sure that all the different sides of the team were functioning. And then um, it would divide out into those four categories below, mechanical control, strategy, and safety net. Now, when 5188 first started, um, we didn't really, we had students who really just kind of focused on those different areas. And I think that's just over the years, um, it's kind of changed where students kind of drift back and forth and might be in controls and safety net. If you're confused what safety net is, that's the operation side of the team. Um, so the the doing the graphic design, the business plan, different things like that. Um, net is non-engineering team. Again, I don't love that term anymore and I don't love non-engineering or anything like that anymore. So um, that was 5188 structure. It was very simple when we started out. Like I said, I started it um, along with some other college mentors. When I was in college, um, we did very basic kind of team structure at the beginning uh, because we were trying to figure it out because we didn't know what was going to work for our group of students because the group of students um, there were very different than other students that I had worked with. And you can say that from neighboring schools. So um, if you take like Center Grove High School, for example, and Greenwood High School, um, they're, they both have first tech challenge teams. I know for a fact those first tech challenge teams do not function the same way, even though they're in neighboring, uh, their neighboring school districts. It's just because what works for them is not the same for another. So please keep that in mind that not one, it's not a one size fit all situation. Okay, now into 1741, we kind of group into three different categories. Um, the mentors, like I said, I think it's important for mentors to know their role. That's not saying every single mentor needs a title or a role definition, uh, but they need to know what their role is on the team and how they want the mentors to interact. Um, so on 1741, we have a lead mentor, which is Nathan Coulomb. He mainly focuses on engineering, but he's kind of the, what you would say, head honcho for our team. Um, he is exactly what it says, lead mentor. Uh, myself, I'm the head operations mentor, so I'm over the operations side, but I also work in tandem um, with Nathan on things like disciplinary issues or um, just making sure everyone's getting their paperwork in on time and different things like that. Really a couple of mentors kind of help with that paperwork piece so it's not super overwhelming. Um, but that's kind of just kind of how we do it. Uh, we do have a teacher sponsor through our school. Um, it is a Project Lead the Way teacher. It's part of their contract. So we do have a teacher sponsor. Our teacher sponsors have been great over the years um, and really act as that liaison between us and the school. 
And I think that's uh, very important for teams to have. I'm not saying every team needs to have a teacher sponsor, but having that relationship with their school, especially if they're based in a school, having that liaison, I think is super important. And we're very lucky that we have one. Um, and then the mentors mainly focus on working with the students. Like I said, we do kind of deal with the paperwork, um, but other than that, we focus on working with the students. Now our parent organization um, is what kind of focuses on everything else. Um, so our parent organization is a separate 501c3. So we do our finances separate from the school. Uh, it's been that way since the very beginning. So it is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, while our students and our and the mentors help too, but it's mainly our students are in charge of fundraising and we do have how much our students need to fundraise every single year in order for us to function. Um, they are the ones fundraising. Our parent organization is the one handling all those finances. Um, they feed the troops, they do all our travel, and then um, we host a lot of different tournaments and they are our tournament support as well. So they're helping um, in any way they can. And then students, we focus on being a, a student-led team, but like I mentioned, we involve them in everything we can. Now we don't involve them in like discipline things or anything like that, um, but we involve them, like I said, in fundraising in every other aspect we can, but we don't involve them in like insurance, getting insurance for a trailer. We don't feel like they really need to do that, um, but we try to involve them in everything else. This is our new student structure actually this year. Uh, we actually, so how we nominate our um, captains and leads is they kind of, they can self nominate or someone else can nominate them. And then we do leadership interviews. Um, a small group of mentors will do leadership interviews and then we will decide which uh, position that they need to be put in. Now, with that being said, uh, at the end of our leadership interviews at the end of last year, so in 2019, uh, we looked and we're like, we need to restructure. We actually just restructured the year before and decided to take out the operations captain and just make it a part of the executive team captain. And we decided it didn't, um, didn't work out well. So we decided to bring that back in. Um, added the mats captain, the spec captain, mats is machining and training safety, uh, spec is, oh, now I got to remember it, strategy, programming, electronic controls. Um, so we have those captains. So our captains and our team executive captain are those kind of like student board, and then everyone else is the leads. Um, so that's kind of like sub team captains. We just use the term leads on our team. And that's all I have. Um, I know Sam has a little has a little bit more about how 3176 does some stuff. Sam, I'll go ahead and click through for you if that's okay. Okay, perfect. And we'll all, we can circle back around if there are any additional questions that come up. So Sam, feel free to take it from here. Okay, so this is um, a chart that we use at the beginning of our school year to talk about how 3176 is student leadership structure um, functions. So um, our team is very much um, a student-led organization. So we have a leadership board that we call the SAB, where we have um, every year it's six to eight students that um, work in tandem for the entire team operations. This past year, we had seven students, as you can see from the chart. Um, those students are picked individually each year. Um, the way our team functions, we usually pick the students and then their roles. So we, the way the leadership and the mentors from past years do it, um, they look at who's applied and they look at who do they think the best team of people can work together is. Um, kind of like the MBTI discussion from earlier, they think about all those personality like types and traits that people have and they combine it to what they think the best board would be. Um, so as you can see, we have that purple box, that's our SAB. So we have the project manager, which is the role I am on the team. That's the kind of the job that where they oversee the leadership structure as a whole. And that's my main point. And then it starts with all of the lines going down. So our, like I said, the SAB works in tandem. So it's not really broken up into sub teams per se. A lot of the SAB members work across sub teams, um, depending on what their job is. 
So the next three SAB positions that we use and are probably the most overarching besides the project manager are our chief engineer, operations manager, and a marketing manager. Um, the chief engineer is our main technical person. They're the person that does all the main robot stuff. They work with all the different technical sub teams, so our electrical programming, design, fabrication, and they work with the SAB members and what we call experts, which are the green, orange, and yellow boxes below. And they work with those people to um, do all the technical work. The operations manager is the person that splits their time across the team, making sure that the um, technical and non-technical have communication between them across lower team members. So they obviously work very closely with everybody on the SAB to get everyone's input, um, just to make sure that the team functions as a whole. And then our marketing manager um, helps with business and our, like our PR and our vision, our team branding. Um, so that's a lot of, so those three um, head SAB members along with the project manager um, work to make sure that the functions of the team as a whole are doing what is right. We usually use an analogy like a steering wheel. Um, you have the project manager that's in the middle of the steering wheel that is there in the middle and kind of sees what's in the wheel. And the further you go out, you have the different parts of your team that you see and can go out to further parts of the team, it all forms one cohesive um, function. So. Um, a big part of our leadership and structure is the way that our subteams function. Um, we have a process that we go through with delegation and leadership. So um, as I talked about in the last slide, we have our SAB members and then we have our subteam leads, which are the people like our design, fabrication, electrical, multimedia, business leaders. There's six subteams on our um, team that, and there's, so there's six people that fill those subteam lead roles. And then from there, we have the task group leaders, which are the people that fulfill different leads within, like the different projects within each subteam. And then there are the group members for those task groups beneath that. So the flow of leadership um, is the same across the team. We make sure to establish that towards the beginning of the year. Um, just to make sure that there is cohesiveness across the team and that way the, the um, communication of leadership can go um, more smoothly across the team. Establishing that early on was really important, especially when build season came around, just to make sure that those end of meeting meetings that I was talking about earlier did have the correct information and that way everybody was represented, especially if somebody had to be absent or anything else were to occur where there was um, an issue or a problem or progress that had been made up to that point. Um, another big part of this structure is a person that's not explicitly mentioned in the structure, but is very important to what we do. There are experts. Um, as you can see from the slide, there are individuals that um, when we applied for leadership in the past year, they've showed proficiency in a certain field. These people provide a lot of roles within the team. They, some of them are subteam leaders. For example, our electrical lead, he's um, not an SAB, but he is an expert. Um, they facilitate communication between subteams. We do have people such as design manufacturing experts or our um, multimedia expert is also a um, electrical person or stuff like that, or people who just provide manufacturing help. Like we do have an advanced manufacturing expert that sole purpose is to be the expert on things such as 3D printing and CNCing, just so that there are facets of our team that the leadership cannot fulfill all on our own because it is a lot. So we have other people that show proficiency and are able to be leaders in that sense. Okay. So a lot of what we do in from our team, from our perspective is to build, making sure everybody does have this meaningful experience is through our off season approach. A lot of what we spend the first couple of months of our year doing are these exploratory months. Students come into the team and they focus on what are the different things that they're interested in? We spend a lot of time focusing on different curriculums and different um, skills, depending on their levels of experience, just on things that they would need to know going into a specific sub team across our team. These um, different curriculums are what we use and they're very basic for the, like I said, for those first couple of months so that students who don't really know, who are going back and forth and across a couple sub teams, which sub team they think is their best fit. We have a lot of students that will start off 
in design and like two weeks later are having a blast in programming or vice versa or whatever sub team they find interesting to them. I, one of my friends was a mechanical person and then he became also the electrical lead um, of our team. So it's really these monks are really spending a lot of time figuring out what really interests you and what make, can make you have the most meaningful experience. Because part of what our team sees is having a meaningful experience is making sure that you're doing something that, you'll, that you really enjoy. Um, there's another big part of that is that we have safety and tool training for every student. Um, we make sure that every student on our team does have the ability to, if not be on a technical sub team, at least know what's going on in the shop. That's really important to us, and obviously from a safety perspective. Um, we just need to make sure that that's part of the experience that students know is very important to us as a leadership and to us as an entire team and to first as an organization, obviously, um, just to make sure that that is part of the experience that they do have and how meaningful that is, maybe not to them specifically, but to everyone around them as well. Um, so that's really, really important to us. The biggest part of our off season besides this training is what we call our education plan. This rolls out along with our handbook that we come out with every year where we have a chart. This year it was a tic-tac-toe board kind of structure where students have to complete a specific amount of these requirements in order to be um, an official member of the team. So we use this to um, see who's done what, what still needs to be done, and what the SAB or the leadership needs to do as a whole going further down into the team. A lot of what we do has two requirements, a financial sponsorship visit, and writing a technical white paper. So on our team, our business team is a team of about four or five people who works on getting all of our funds, but obviously it's a lot to ask for them to go out into the community and get our corporate sponsors. So it is a requirement for every student on our team to go on a financial sponsorship visit and go out to the businesses in our community and talk to the people and get the funds from them. So we do create a very personal relationship with our sponsors and that's a big part of what our team does to create um, a presence in our community across the board and it really helps because the students then see how important that is and how important not necessarily the robot is to our organization but how important the operations side is a lot of what we also need to expand on across our team is just the knowledge that we um, have over the past couple of years we've noticed that after different students have left and after they've had proficiency in a specific field and there was an, there was like a mix-up of a necessarily of somebody wasn't taught something specific, we noticed that a way to effectively make sure that this knowledge had been passed on, not even necessarily from our team to younger team members, these white papers are also on our website for everyone to access, just so that the information that we have is information that we can make public to everyone else. So that what people are learning, even if it's how to listen to a fabrication lecture and for it to be effective to you, just something that you know and something that you have knowledge for that students can share making sure that they know that the knowledge that they have here is something that they can share is really important to us. And making sure that um, across the board, students know that they're getting something out of the team and making sure that what we provided as leadership is something that we can um, make sure is effective to the students we're trying to provide for. The community outreach portion is another um, big part of our education plan. There's a bunch of spots on the education plan for that. Um, we have a lot of outreach opportunities across our off season about, um, for example, community nights at our elementary schools or Relay for Life or something like that where students can go out and provide service hours to these different events and then they can see not necessarily, like I said, how a robot performs, but how we perform in the community outside of our financial sponsorships, how we affect the students and the people that um, may not necessarily see first because until this past year, when we started an FLL team in one of our middle schools, FRC at the high school was the only um, first um, program that we had, which we're really fortunate to now have an FLL team, but that, that community outreach was, has been and still is extremely important to what we do. At the end of all of this, at the end of our off season, um, we, had, we do obviously ask students to pick a sub team so that we can make build season more effective. But at the end of the year, at the end of first semester, so right before kickoff, students must complete a proof of skills for their specific sub team. This helps the leadership be able to see the proficiency in a student selected sub team. Um, it helps them learn what students already know and what students 
um, have taken with them across the off season. And it also lets us know going into build season, what still needs to be taught and what we still need to focus on um, education wise. Obviously build season is a whole different atmosphere. So learning is a little more complicated, but just going into build season, knowing that this is what students already know is something that not only helps students realize what their skills and what obviously have they have learned over the past year. And it's definitely a growth thing to see where students have started from August and gotten all the way to December. Um, so it's as much of a growth thing as it is an educational thing for leadership. So, and we use that to make sure that going into build season, we can be the most effective with what the students already know. Fantastic. So, wow. Yeah. So, I think Chris had a couple of questions either come in, um, I think for either both groups or maybe we just had questions, but that was totally awesome. Both yeah. of you. Yeah, from both, both teams. There's a lot of really great things there that uh, I think we'll definitely be sharing a lot of that stuff out via the, the FIN website. Uh, just two quick questions. Uh, one for Sam, one for Rachel. Sam, um, you, you guys are pretty organized. You get, you're getting your team ready. Is there one thing outside of outreach and all that? Is there one thing that uh, 3176 as a team does that maybe fun or, or goofy? Is there something that you guys do that's a t team building or silly or do you guys ever do anything like that? Um, yeah, we do have a couple parties throughout the year. A lot of people have like office Christmas parties. We have like a 30, like our last meeting at the end of the um, semester is a Christmas party. At the end of the year, we have like a fun little get together that's like a picnic and like an accomplishment thing of like, here's what we've done um, for the past year. And that's just like, four or five hours of us just sitting together and playing games and like just um, reminiscing obviously on all the memories that we've made for like the past like four or five months. Um, across the different um, meetings throughout, we do have a lot of opportunities where we can go and like contact different sub team leaders, get to know people. Um, we do a lot of icebreakers the first three or four weeks. We do just spend purely on getting to know everyone and getting to know people's personalities. Our second week actually we do a shark tank activity which is where we, the, the SAB goes to the dollar store and just buys a bunch of random things. And then we come back and people have to make an invention. Um, and then we judge them and one person, one group wins. So it's really fun. Pat, the past year they won a whoopee cushion, so. Well, I really fun. like that. Yeah, that's a good the Shark Tank activity. That's, a, that's fun. And it, it, it uh, kind of sharpens the entrepreneurship skills. Uh, yeah, especially if you're going to be going out and asking for sponsorships. Uh, Rachel, you guys, you talked about the, the parent organization uh, with Red Alert. We have a, a lot of teams out there in Indiana that in different phases of that where they've just started one or they're considering starting one. Uh, Red Alert's had one now for a while. Uh, can you talk a little, a little bit of maybe about the about that relationship between the team and the parent organization and kind of the, the differing roles, how they work together, but are kind of doing different things? Definitely, definitely. Um, one sec. I, I don't have them on this computer, sorry. Um, I was gonna pull up our bylaws, but I can just kind of talk about it. Um, so how we divide up our parent organization is we have a president and a vice president, um, a treasurer, and FTC um, representation because uh, our parent organization actually covers um, the Red Alert organization as a whole. So that includes our pipeline. So that includes our First Tech Challenge, our FLL. That we don't necessarily do the finances of FLL, but we do um, mentor and just make sure they're chugging along throughout their season. Um, and then we have a secretary and kind of those common roles that you would see in a nonprofit. Um, but how we kind of define the line between what the parent organization does and what the mentors do is the mentors, um, like I said, focus on what working with the students, working directly with the students. And the parent organization does a lot of the background information. Um, so like I said, since they kind of do our finances, since they are the nonprofit, they do our travel. Um, so they are paying our buses, um, they are booking and paying for our hotels. So they kind of do that background um, information and Red Alert is more than willing to share all the bylaws and all of our documentation that we have uh, for our parent organization if any team is interested in that. I don't think it's on our website right now, but we can get it up on our website. Um, I know 
I know our president right now is actually uh, reaching out to a couple different teams who have reached out to us saying like, hey, you have a parent organization, how do we do that? So if you're interested in getting any of that stuff, we can certainly help with that. But like I said, kind of the difference between what a mentor does and what the parent organization does is the parent organization is doing a lot of the background information, uh, the background work with our tournaments. So they're running uh, the food to feed all our student volunteers and the food to just feed our regular volunteers at our, all our tournaments. Uh, we host a turn, we host FTC and FLL tournaments every single year. Sometimes we host FRC, we've hosted FLL Junior, we've hosted a lot of different tournaments. So they are uh, running the rooms. So the side rooms of um, the, oh, I'm blanking on the term the volunteer lounge. Uh, so they're running the volunteer lounge um, and making sure the volunteers are properly fueled. Um, and then let's see, what else does our parent organization do? They do a lot of our insurance stuff. Um, so we kind of have the unique relationship that we are a separate nonprofit financially, but uh, we're still within a school. We still meet at our school. Um, so they are also working with our teacher sponsor a lot to be that liaison with the school. Um, so like uh, some of our really big machinery, um, we cover as a red alert organization for insurance, like our trailer and different things like that. Um, but our CNC and different things like that we've actually donated to the school. So the school has the insurance. So uh, our parent organization or RARPO, Red Alert Robotics Parent Organization, um, they kind of figure out those different pieces, the pieces that aren't every day, but are still really important for our team to function. Well, that's that's fantastic information. Yeah, and I did uh, on the chat, I threw out a link, <coughs> a link to the uh, RARPO page for the Red Alert and um, also, Sam, I threw out a, uh, a link to your guys, uh, the 3176 white papers. Uh, we are at 7 o'clock. It's been a fantastic uh, virtual conference day. Uh, a lot of really great content today. Rachel, uh, thank you so much for talking about uh, ensuring uh, when you have teams and you've got all these students, how they can uh, stay engaged. Sam, bring in some real world examples from your own team as well. Um, and Renee, some great conversations today. Learn a lot about 3D printing. Uh, and we have a lot going on tomorrow. Isn't that right, Renee? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what we have going on tomorrow is absolutely something that will be absolutely amazing, especially as soon as Chris and I actually pull up what we're doing tomorrow. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm going to throw it up on the screen yeah. and, uh, and let everybody see our schedule real quick for tomorrow. Um, here we go. Let me get this out of the way. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, we've got um, self-care during self-isolation, uh, a panel discussion. Uh, we're going to meet the, the 2020 FinFam rookies, uh, our three rookie teams from this year. Uh, we've got some great pictures. Uh, we're going to have some representation from each of the teams to talk about their experience as rookies. Uh, two of our three rookie teams did get to compete. Um, but, but, I, but I ultimately, I think the big thing is that they all went through that really crucial build experience. I think that that uh, that's really the heart of kind of what, what we're about. Uh, and then uh, Carl from Blue First is going to lead a, a panel. He's got several um, uh, mentors and folks coming from other teams to talk about that moment when a team felt like they went from just surviving to thriving. Uh, and so I think that'll be a really great conversation. Teams can listen in. Uh, teams that maybe are, are in that mode where they feel like they're just every year just kind of treading water, maybe get some advice and, and learn a little bit about what can they do to go from survive to thrive. I like that title. Uh, and then finally, we're going to be um, one of our student board of directors, uh, Devin Langley, is going to be uh, interviewing Andy Maluzzi. He's a senior systems engineer with Walt Disney Parks uh, and Resorts, uh, and he's a first senior mentor. Uh, and so we're going to be uh, uh, hearing that interview, that'll be exciting. Uh, so a good day tomorrow uh, to wrap up this uh, two-day virtual conference, and of course, more to come next week. All right. Thanks, everybody. This has been fantastic. We appreciate it. Have a good night, everybody.